Yes, yes, we don't like to start too on time around here. Of course, you guys know most of my live streaming is done on Sunday. Uh, for a while, we had the regular Sunday thing, Starry Wisdom Sunday, may ring a bell. So me using the name Lucifer means light bringer. Gathering on Sunday, of course, it became Starry Wisdom Sunday Church. We riffed on evil church, symbolism church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And like any good church service, you have to give people a few minutes, sort of file into the pews, right? Uh, yes, I thought I would be cheeky and dress up like the banner. Purple eyes, blue shirt. And got a beard on my cheeky. All right, so here we are. We're in the, uh, this is uh, LML's favorite chapters, A Song of Ice and Fire Hall of Fame. I did make a playlist for this today, by the way. Um, yes, I did. Made a playlist with all the non Wow chapter readings. And uh, let's see, let's see, we could find it around here somewhere. Ah, uh, yes, here it is. Oh, no, this is not, that is not it. Let me go back. Apologies. Of course, you click the playlist tab on YouTube. There it is. View full playlist. And find all my playlists there. I do tend to organize my material pretty well with the playlists. And here is for the read-alongs. The non wow read-alongs. There's also a T-Wow playlist, which has both the T-Wow read-alongs as well as the Winds of Winter prediction series that I did with Quinn. Uh, so, yeah. And guys, by the way, if the, for those of you still getting me a, a, about uh, the last few wins predictions, one Hodor um, revealing RLJ and a couple others, probably going to let those sit until the, uh, the actual wins announcement comes out and, you know, all the enthusiasm rushes back and everyone wants to talk about it. That way we'll have a little fresh something to come back to, kick some life into the series and all that. Uh, so... We haven't forgotten about Hodor, Sansa, or any of the other things we're going to talk about. In fact, we came up with a few more ideas for Winds of Winter prediction topics, like the Citadel, Robert's Bastards, and uh, we'll be we'll be doing all that. Whenever George announces T-Wow, which in case you missed it, the LML channel is the place to be for positivity. I did not mean to rhyme. I'm sorry. On my enemies. Yeah, what's up, Tupac? So... Right here is just say, you know, if you, the quickest way to get blocked in my comments is to say something negative about T. Wow's never going to come out. Blah, 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 blah. So we'll go ahead and start our show with a moment of appreciation and encouragement for our friend George R. Martin. Thank you, George, for writing these books, for bringing us together, for giving us a world to dive into, a world so fun and immersive that here we are 10 years after any printed material. Well, Fire and Blood came out, I guess, but. You get the point. We're all still gathered around the campfire here, telling stories, retelling stories, and uh, welcome around, friends. It is George Martin who has brought us together. So positivity to George and, of course, all creative fire and energy, all the fire of the gods that's out there. We uh, confer it on to George. Yes. All right. So, um, yeah, there we go. So that being said... We're going to dive into a fun chapter. This is White Walker Central. This is the first Sam chapter of Storm of Swords. And it is essentially, it begins with the recap of the Fist of the First Men. And then it moves on to Sam's encounter with the White Walker. So this is basically the most White Walker action we have in any chapter. It's, it's basically this and the Waymar prologue of A Game of Thrones. There's not a lot of actual White Walkers uh, the only two times they're on screen, in fact, is this chapter and the uh, the Game of Thrones prologue. Savage Sam the Slayer. Sam the Slayer. Yes, that's right. That's what we're here for. And, of course, you can send in your comments or questions, preferably somewhat related to the action as we're talking. PayPal.me, Mythical Astronomy. This is the best way to support the program. You can also use the Super Chat function inside of PayPal. You can also sign up for Patreon, and you can definitely subscribe to the channel, leave comments, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, guys, I've been making, also, last, before we start the chapter, I want to tell you I've been making great progress on the Nightbringer series. Um, I am, I've, it's going to be a five video video, 
if you will. It would have been an hour and 25 minute video. I chopped it into five parts. That way they're nice and snappy, you know, 10 to 20 minutes each for YouTube. Hopefully we'll juice the algorithm and get them doing a dance, you know, a little algorithm dance. And uh, sorry, that wasn't very good. And uh, yeah, so we're going to, we're going to, I'm always trying to, you know, I work hard over here. Obviously you guys send me notes of appreciation all the time, thanking me for my hard work, for my streaming, for my research, attention to detail, pulling, digging up all the art, all the little things that I do to try to make my channel the best. Um, so what I'm trying to do is get YouTube to pay me more for the work that I'm already doing. It's all about tricking the algorithm and getting the traffic to come towards you. So us YouTubers are always trying new tags and new tricks and things. So chopping up the video is one thing I'm going to try to do. I'm going to put it, put it out next week, Monday through Friday. I'm close enough to the end where I can announce that. Next week is Nightbringer week. It's going to be Monday through Friday. Oh, gosh, my blood pressure just went up as I'm saying this. I think I got it. Uh, I've finished the first four videos, and I'm into the fifth one already. So I know I can start releasing them next week and should definitely be able to finish uh, the fifth one by Friday, well before. So yeah, next week is Nightbringer week. Be one video every day for five days and you guys would be excited. Yeah, in case you haven't seen the Nightbringer art, I will just get you pumped with that real quick. Oh yeah. B4, five, there we go. Open right up. Share screen. We're moving quick. We're moving quick. Everything is working. Except for let's start with the first one. There we go. Nightbringer, Nightbringer. Da -da 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 -da. Give me some lyrics, guys. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Nightbringer, Nightbringer. I'll stop now. Sorry. Tank in the stream. There's only 64 people watching. It's Friday night. Friday night frights. Yes, we've started. Re I, I did the spooky Theon 2 chapter last Friday, and I think I'm going to stick with doing spooky chapters on Friday night. Seems fun. Of course, welcome to those of you for whom it is Saturday morning in Europe. Probably more of you. <laughs> Let's get a vote in the chat. How many of you are still experiencing the end of their Friday, and how many are on the beginning of their Saturday? Let me know. And here is Nightbringer 1, the Bleeding Star. Going to kind of lay out the whole thing. Legends of the Long Night going to show going to show the peons and plebs out there that they need to think about falling stars when they think about the Long Night. Of course, thinking about Bloodstone Emperor and Dawn, all that stuff. Part three will be the Red Sword of Shy, and that is what the oh geez, um, Red Sword. Okay, sorry, I'm just navigational difficulty. Uh, part three, Red Sword of Shy. This is the Great Empire of the Dawn condensed. Um, just bringing out the relevance to show that like the Azor High Myth and Last Hero stuff's all connected. So all these meteors are connected, connected to the Long Night, connected to each other, big circle of meteors. And then we've got part four, Moon Dragons. Need I say more? This is outlying all the moon mythology, having proved that asteroids and meteors are the things to look for. We got to figure out where they came from. They came from the moon, as you guys know. Part five, as above, so below, going to teach the plebs some symbolism. I say plebs with, with love in my heart, of course. The, uh, the, the, we were all plebs once, right? I certainly was before I uh, read A Song of Ice and Fire and a little bit of Graham Hancock and had my brain blown up. Anyways, Nightbringer, as above, so below. This is going to be the symbolism, sort of following it up. Because I'm proving the, proving the case with more logic, you know, the original moon meteors theory, uh, what what caused the long night? I started with the symbolism. Some people get lost that way. So we're going to do it logically first and then follow up with the symbolism. And there you go. Let's read some Sam Tarly. And of course, we've got some Sam art to show off as well. Just a couple of Sam pieces, but we'll set the vibe for the chapter here before we start marching through the snow. Actually, I'll read a little bit and then I'll pull up the art. Let's get let's get it going. I've I've dithered long enough. It looks like no, I'm not I'm not looking for technically whether it's Friday or Saturday. Technically, it's Saturday everywhere, but it is Friday until you go to sleep, even if that's Saturday morning at six a.m. So it's like it might be for me. Yeah. 
Sam Tarly. Sam the Slayer. This is actually the 18th chapter of A Storm of Swords. We did get a little clue about the fist in the prologue. The prologue is the Chet prologue. I almost considered reading that, but Chet is so unpleasant. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. He's 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 just a disgusting little creep. He might even be worse than Vermeer. I don't know. There's Chet is Chet is a messed up individual. I just didn't want to read it. In any case, Chet is one of the uh, one of the plotters, one of the Night's Watch mutineers, if you will. And the prologue gives us very strong clue. Basically, spells out that there's a mutiny plot uh, afoot. It was going to be sprung at the fist, and then it did not happen. Um, and that is the clue that we're going to get before it resurfaces at Craster's in Sam's, I believe it's Sam's second chapter, is the Craster's Keep chapter. I almost read that one too, uh, but I figured we'd do this one since it has all the White Walker action, and then we'll do that Craster's Keep chapter sometime in the near future. So having set the stage... It says, sobbing, Sam took another step. This is the last one, the very last. I can't go on, I can't. But his feet moved again, one and then the other. They took a step and then another. And he thought, they're not my feet, they're someone else's. Someone else is walking, it can't be me. So this is, starting off, sobbing, Sam took another step. So basically, this, this chapter is the nadir of Sam's craven identity. He is reaching the lowest point of his fear and weakness. And it's going to end, of course, with him slaying the White Walker and becoming Sam the Slayer, which even though he doesn't feel brave about it at first, it eventually is something that he can fall back on and be proud of. So this is definitely a lot of personal transformation coming in this chapter. And that conflict is represented. He's sobbing like, like a coward or like someone who's very afraid. Uh, but yet he's taking another step, right? And he's he's having almost an out of body experience. So it's he's, he's you could you know George really uh, he this is there's some masterful writing going on in, in the beginning of this chapter. Basically, the only thing that's happening is that Sam is walking in the snow. He's very very tired and he's about to pass out. But you, you can see what George is doing with flashback memories, cutting into Sam's walk to sort of bring the scene to life and make it exciting. And he's also telling the, the Fist of the First Men in a very disjointed, non-linear way, which contributes to the terror and disorientation uh, that everyone felt at the Fist, and it makes the reader feel that as well. So that dis disorientation, confusion from the Fist is juxtaposed against the extreme exhaustion that Sam is now feeling afterwards. So that's what's happening. Sam's taking another step. He's sobbing. And it says, when he looked down, he could see them stumbling through the snow, his feet, that is, shapeless things and clumsy. His boots had been black, he seemed to remember, but the snow had caked around them, and now they were misshapen white balls, like two club feet made of ice. So symbolism alert. He's transforming. He used to be a night's watchman. Looks like he's transforming into something made of ice. His, his feet are club feet. He has icy club feet now. It would not stop the snow. The drifts were up to his knees, and a crust covered his lower legs like a pair of white greaves. That's an even bigger hint. Greaves are armor. So he's wearing snow armor now. That's very clear white walker symbolism. So we're already, the chapter begins, we're looking out for white walker symbolism, and so, you know what, we'll have to see what that where that goes. Spoiler alert, I know where it goes, but We'll pretend like I don't. Uh, let's see. Um, his steps were dragging, lurching. The heavy pack he carried made him look like some monstrous hunchback. And he was tired, so tired. I can't go on. Mother, have mercy, I can't. And the word monster is key. Um, you know, monster is used, obviously, for Gilly's baby, who is the who is the signature good other template in the story besides John. He is the baby rescued from the others and he's rescued by the Night's Watch, brought safely into the green lands, stolen from the others. One of the things they were going to do with Baby Monster was raise him at Winterfell with John becoming the Lord of Winterfell and, and comparing himself to Monster, John being another symbolic Night's Queen baby. So 
case you don't know, just make sure you know this big theory of mine. Um, read uh, Symbolism of the Other's Night's Queen or the Blood of the Other podcast series. It seems that one of the children of Night's Queen and King from way back in the day was, was saved or rescued, stolen, however you want to say it, and raised at Winterfell. And thereby the bloodline of Night's King and Queen is now in the Starks. Now, of course, Night's King probably was a Stark, or perhaps it was Night's Queen that was a Stark. That's actually my theory. Um, however, that, you know, at how, whatever magical transformation happened to Night's King, remember he gave his seed and soul to Night's Queen, then he started giving babies to the others and stuff, strongly implied that there was a magical, icy transformation there. So it's one of his children that comes after that Night's King transformation that comes back into the bloodline of Stark, according to my theory. And it's not only my theory. Other people have nosed around at this too. Um, the idea that the Starks have the blood of the other to, as a parallel to the Targaryens that have the blood of the dragon is not like super cryptic. It's occurred to a lot of people. So there it is. Eric Ash, will the disoriented retreat from the fist be mirrored in a chaotic flight from Old Town in winds? Um, let me think about that one for a second. Why? Because Sam is um, involved in both. Uh, I do think Alaris the Sphinx will help Sam flee since they're all like Marwyn's little circle of people are together now. Um, but yeah, they, they probably will have a chaotic retreat. I don't think Sam's going to get captured by Euron. I don't think that would serve the plot. Um, so yeah, I think he will escape. And I do think Euron's going to take Old Town. So it is possible. Uh, I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, perhaps. Definitely, definitely going to be people fleeing Old Town for their lives. So just finishing up with a good other theory. The idea is that this child who is stolen from Night's King and Queen gets raised as a Stark. And although the timeline is wonky here, I believe that the last hero may have been such a child. So I think Night's King and Queen actually lived during the long night and not afterwards. Or you could say that if Night's King and Queen of Record did live after the long night, there must have been an original pair that made the white walkers right like if if the white walkers need babies to make white walkers well somebody must have done it first i think that the knight's king and queen story is the story of the first people but even if you even if it wasn't you'd have to have something similar first so point is the last hero seems to be a stolen other baby grown up who's now stark or something like that uh, many of the figures who symbolize the last hero, Sam and John being chief among them, um, tend to have icy symbolism. They tend to have the symbolism of the others and yet to not fight for the others. So John, for example, in his Azor High Dream, quote unquote, he dreams of wielding a burning red sword, but he's armored in black ice. And again, ice armor is the others wear ice armor. So when somebody wears ice armor or armor that looks icy, we should think about them as an other character. Sir Barristan, in Marine is another one. He wears white armor that's snow white and hard as ice and all this stuff. But he is fighting for Danny, the dragon, and he has a helmet with dragon wings on it. So he's basically got an ice dragon armor suit cosplay that he wears. And this is typical of the good other figure. They have base, you know, think about John, right? He's got the dragon Targaryen symbolism, but combined with the winter ice symbolism of Winterfell. And so you could almost think about John as an ice dragon in terms of his lineage, right? So all the last hero figures are have that ice symbolism, often ice dragon symbolism, and I've nicknamed that the good other. So that seems like where Sam is going here. Sam is a very heroic character. However, he's wearing ice greaves and he's got ice feet. Uh, so let's let's see how this goes, right? Oh, I did a mute. I did a mute. Ah, it's been several weeks since I did a good mute. 
All right. No, it's not just you. Okay, so every fourth or fifth step, he had reached down and tug up his sword belt. And I said, boy, that sounds annoying, right? It's like when you leave the house and you forget to put your belt on and you're wearing that one pair of pants that's a little too big and just keeps falling down. Very annoying. And then it says he'd lost his sword on the fist, but the scabbard still weighed down the belt. So you immediately you wonder, why is he still have this the scabbard if he doesn't have the sword? Why not just lose it if it's causing him this much difficulty? But he's so tired and delirious. I guess he hasn't even thought of that, right? So that's a what's a happening. All that weight dragged heavy, and his belly was so big and round that if he forgot to tug the belt, uh, if he forgot to tug, the belt slipped right off and tangled around his ankles, no matter how tight he cinched it. He had tried belting it above his belly once, but then it came almost to his armpits. Gren had laughed himself sick at the sight of it, and Dollar's head had said, I knew a man once who wore his sword on a chain around his neck like that. One day he stumbled and the hilt went up his nose. Sam was stumbling himself. There were rocks beneath the snow and the roots of trees and sometimes deep holes in the frozen ground. Black Bernard had stepped in one and broken his ankle three days past, or maybe four, or he did not know how long it had been truly. The Lord Commander had put Bernard on a horse after that. So three or four days out from the fist, that's where we are. And Sam is totally sort of just coming in and out of consciousness here. Uh, let's see. Sobbing, Sam took another step. It felt like he was fall more like he was falling down than walking, falling endlessly, but never hitting the ground, just falling forward and forward. I have to stop. It hurts too much. I'm so cold and tired. I need to sleep, just a little sleep beside a fire and a bite to eat that isn't frozen. So real quick, that's definitely an astronomy uh, alert there. Falling, falling, endlessly falling, but never hitting the ground. Um, Sam is a, quite often a moon character. He has a moon face on four different occasions in the books, more than any other character. So he's very strongly associated with the moon. Um, and uh, so I suspect what is going on here in astronomy wise is that he's kind of like a falling meteor that's somehow getting frozen, like lodged in the ice or something like that. Um, he's a broken off piece of moon. He's falling but he's freezing instead of catching on fire. So I do believe that just a quick digression. Um, last week we did ask, ask LML about your theories for, we talked a lot about the heart of winter. And of course, I definitely think it's a strong chance. We're going to find an oily black stone moon meteor in the heart of winter perhaps even the one the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped, because the Bloodstone Emperor might have come all the way to Westeros and become the Night's King. And so, there might have been a meteor that landed in the Heart of Winter. Now, Azor High, the dragon himself, symbolizes a meteor. And when he goes into the Weirwood Net, that is essentially a lot, that is a parallel to the Thunderbolt of the Storm God setting the tree ablaze. Azor High is like the meteor that sets Westeros ablaze, sets the Weirwood Net ablaze, etc. So, if there is one meteor that fell in the north, then it would have frozen. Um, and that could explain part of the magic that animates the others, potentially. So just as Azor High went in the Weirwood Net and seems to have forced out the others or created the others, there could be a layer to the magic of the others that depends on a black meteor. That would just basically be a parallel, essentially. So Sam falling here and freezing, he could be that heart of winter meteor symbol. I know that's getting a little abstract, but it's just that's the astronomy part of it. Mm. All right. Oh, that's good tea. All right. Let's see. So he wants a bite to eat that isn't frozen. But if he stopped, he died. He knew that. They all knew the few who were left. They had been 50 when they fled the fist, maybe more, but some had wandered off in the snow. A few wounded had bled to death, and sometimes Sam heard shouts behind them from the rear guard, and once an awful scream. When he heard that, he had run. 
20 yards or 30 as fast as he could, his half-frozen feet kicking up the snow. He would be running still if his legs were stronger. They are behind us. They are still behind us. They are taking us one by one. Sobbing, Sam took another step. He had been cold so long, he was forgetting what it felt like to be warm. He, For me, that happens after about 20 minutes in the cold. <laughs> uh, Mike Hall with a good comment here. Military defeat's got to be one of the worst feelings in the world. Your friends are dead. You're exhausted. But you have to keep walking in the cold or you'll die. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for adding that extra perspective. You're totally right. And think about the criticalness, critical nature of the of the mission. They went to the fist to try to thwart the the wildlings and then ended up fighting the others, which is an even more dire foe. And they lost and they were slaughtered. And they're supposed to be the main fighting force protecting and manning the wall. And they just got their asses whooped. So it's extremely demoralizing. Great point, Mike. And many of their friends are dead or missing. Oh, let's see here. So thanks for that. Yeah, it's pretty grim. It's Friday, Friday night frights. Uh, let's see. So he wore three pairs of hose, two layers of small clothes beneath a double lamb's wool tunic, and over that a thick quilted coat, coat that padded him against the cold steel of his chain mail. Over the hauberk, he had a loose surcoat, and over that, a triple thick cloak with a bone button that fastened tight under his chins. His chins, plural. Its hood flopped forward over his forehead. Heavy fur mitts covered his hands over thin wool and leather gloves. A scarf was wrapped snugly about the lower half of his face, and he had a tight-fitting fleece-lined cap to pull down over his ears beneath the hood. And still the cold was in him. And that, of course, is a signature symbolism line um, the fire being inside of you is, is a big fire transformation line. Danny has the fire inside of her when she wakes the dragons. Melisandre has the fire inside of her when she sees a Reloris vision or gives birth to a shadow baby. And in the prologue, the Waymar Game of Thrones prologue, where Waymar becomes an ice white at the end, it's all about ice transformation. And they're talking about frostbite through the whole chapter and comparing it basically describing it in language that that seems to describe some sort of transformation into an other. So here we have Sam saying the cold was in him. This is another clue that he is undergoing some kind of ice transformation. So the cold was in him, his feet especially. He couldn't even feel them by now, but only yesterday they hurt so bad he could hardly bear to stand on them, let alone walk. Every step made him want to scream. Was that yesterday? He could not remember. He had not slept since the fist. Oh, God. So he's been up for three days. Not once since the horn had blown, unless it was while he was walking. Could a man walk while he was sleeping? Sam did not know, or else he had forgotten. It kind of makes him sound like a white, doesn't it? Sort of sleepwalking, half dead, half awake. Sobbing, he took another step. The snow swirled down around him. Sometimes it fell from a white sky and sometimes from a black but that was all that remained of day and night. He wore it on his shoulders like a second cloak and it piled high atop the pack he carried and made it even heavier and harder to bear. So if he's wearing a cloak of snow, that's another big other symbol. The King's Guard symbolized the others. They wear the snow white cloaks. So now he has a snowy cloak. So he's absolutely turning into some sort of other. Or white, one or the other. Either one could work. We'll have to see which makes more sense. Uh, oh, yes, that's right. I did get a PayPal before the show started from Paul. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, let's, let's so let's pause the Sam. Actually, I'll hold this for a second. When we get to a pausing point, there's a couple of things from the last stream that I didn't catch that I want to uh, go back, PayPal or two, talking about Fagon and John Con. But let's keep going with this one a little bit here. Okay, so. The small of his back hurt abominably and as if someone had shoved a knife in there and was wiggling it back and forth with every step. His shoulders were in agony from the weight of the mail. He would have given anything to take it off, but he was afraid to. Anyway, he would have needed to remove his cloak and surcoat to get at it, and then the cold would have him. So the idea that he's got a knife in his back and he's still walking, that's another transformation symbol. Of course, 
Azor Ahai stabbed Nissa, Nissa and that essentially killed her and transferred her soul and essence into Lightbringer. Um, uh, you know, when you stab a White Walker, they come undone, right? So could be that that's part of the transformation here, but it's, that's just a theoretical, so I'll just throw that out. See, if only I was stronger. He wasn't, though, and it was no good wishing. Sam was weak and fat, so very fat. He could hardly bear his own weight. The mail was much too much for him. It felt as though it was rubbing his shoulders raw, despite the layers of cloth and quilt between the steel and skin. The only thing he would do, or he could do, was cry. And when he cried, the tears froze on his cheeks. Sobbing, he took another step. The crust was broken. Where So that was the first sentence of the chapter. Sobbing, he took another step. So it's being used as a refrain, isn't it? Yes, yeah, sobbing, he took another step. That was the first one. Um, and then, yep, sobbing, he took another step. It felt more like he was falling down than walking. And then again, sobbing, he took another step. The cold, he had been cold so long, he was forgetting what it was like to feel warm. Sobbing, he took another step. The snow swirled down all around him. So this is like that brand chapter where it says, you know, the moon was thin as the blade of a knife. It's like, it happens three or four times. So here we've got sobbing, he took another step as a refrain. The snow, so this is how Martin is communicating the monotony of the march, right? Uh, it's all the same moment, sort of. Sobbing, uh, see, so the only thing he could do was cry. The tears froze on his cheeks. Sobbing, he took another step. The crust was broken where he set his feet. Otherwise, he did not think he could have moved at all. Off to the left and right, half seen through the silent trees, torches turned to vague orange halos in the falling snow. When he, when he turned his head, he could see them, slipping silent through the wood, bobbing up and down and back and forth. Okay, so the White Walkers slip silently through the wood, obviously. But here we have um, torches that are like halos. So that implies angels, right? Well, angels, we should probably just think spirits. So... These could be fiery Night's Watch spirits or Green Seer spirits, or they could be the others who, of course, have cold burning star eyes. But in any case, there are angels, fiery beings with halos, slipping silently through the woods. So let's just put a, put a pin in that. The old bear's ring of fire, he reminded himself, and woe to him who leaves it. As he walked, it seemed as if he were chasing the torches ahead of him, but they had legs as well, longer and stronger than his, so he could never catch them. So he's falling forever. He's chasing a torch. Hey, it's Quinn's ideas. Hey, Quinn, what's going on, man? Up late. Lots of Dune news brewing lately. Guys, if you're excited about the new Dune movie, of course, Quinn's ideas, the place to go. Or the new Foundation TV show. I saw the trailer for Foundation today. Definitely looked cool. I know Quinn is fired up about that and covers Foundation on his channel. So Quinn's ideas, everyone. We're, uh, we're marching away from the uh, Fist of the First Men here. So, guys, the Old Bear's Ring of Fire, this almost, if, if you remember back to the Fist of the First Men, they ringed the fist in torches. And when Melisandre and Stannis look at the first, uh, the Fist of the First Men through a fire vision, there's a cool moment where they're peering through the, the fire in the fireplace, and the fire becomes a ring of torches. And they're looking down on the fist from above, and they see the ring of torches, and they see the attack. So that to me sounds like a moon deal. The fist is always a moon symbol. Think of Benero making a fist to symbolize the moon and then exploding it in fire. Here we have the fist of the first men with literally a circle of fire. And then the others attack it and it gets all busted up. And now we have just like a moon meteor falling from the moon. Now we have this long train, this long line of Night's Watchmen carrying torches. And remember, Sam is saying that he's not really walking. He's sort of falling and falling. So you have to think of this old bear's ring of fire as the moon meteors falling towards the ground. And they're all just falling and walking and falling. They're also slipping silently through the wood. So that sounds like Azor High has gone into the Weirwood Net or something like that. And of course, the Night's Watch swear their oaths to the Weirwoods. And if the original Night's Watch were resurrected, as I always like to say that they were, then they would have been 
resurrected through the magic of the green seers and the weirwood net and that's that's why they swear their oaths to the weirwoods and the green seers in my opinion yesterday he begged for them to let him be one of the torchbearers even if it meant walking outside of the column with the darkness pressing close he wanted the fire dreamed of the fire if i had the fire i would not be cold but someone reminded him that he'd had a torch at the start but he dropped it in the snow and snuffed the fire out. Sam didn't remember dropping any torch, but he supposed it was true. He was too weak to hold his arm up for long. Was it Ed who reminded him about the torch, or Gren? He couldn't remember that either. Fat and weak and useless. Even my wits are freezing now. He took another step. So he's definitely lost the fire. Some of the Night's Watchmen still have the fire, and some of them are freezing. So this could be talking about the bifurcation of the White Walkers and the Night's Watch, the Black Brothers and the White Others. Um, they obviously seem like opposites. They are on either side of the wall. They fight, you know, again, the, the White Walkers are called White Shadows and the Black Brothers are Black Shadows. They're called Shadows a whole bunch of times. So I have speculated that the creation of the White Walkers, which obviously, as I've said, has to do with the Weirwoods and the Green Men and all that stuff, also is tied to the the raising of the first Night's Watch green zombies. Um, in fact, you can almost imagine green men being killed to power the creation of the others, but perhaps those green men then being resurrected as the Night's Watch. So you almost have the same souls being split in half. You might see that with John as well, by the way. John's spirit has gone into his direwolf, which looks like a weirwood tree, right? And his body is freezing and might be stolen by the others and temporarily whited. So I think there is some sort of bifurcation. The others and the original green zombie watchmen, they go back, they have a common origin or their, their, their separate origins are tied to the same event, something along those lines. And we're actually going to get a lot more clues about that in the Craster's Keep chapter that we'll read soon, which is Sam's next chapter in this book. So we've got some of the Night's Watch with torches and some of them are freezing. And Sam's, even my wits are freezing now. So literally his mind is freezing. He's freezing inside and out. The cold is in him. It's a very thorough transformation. Mm. He had wrapped his scarf over his nose and mouth, but it was covered with snot now. And so stiff he feared it must be frozen to his face. Even breathing was hard and the air was so cold it hurt to swallow. Mother, have mercy, he muttered in a hushed, husky voice beneath the frozen mask. Mother, have mercy. Mother, have mercy. Mother, have mercy. With each prayer, he took another step, dragging his legs through the snow. Mother, have mercy. His own mother was a thousand leagues south, safe with his sisters and his little brother Dickon in the keep at Horn Hill. She can't hear me, no more than the mother above. The mother was merciful. All the septums agreed, but the seven had no power beyond the wall. This was where the old gods ruled, the nameless gods of the trees and the wolves and the snows. Mercy, he whispered then, to whatever he might be listening, old gods or new or demons too. Oh, mercy me, mercy me. Maslin screamed for mercy. Why had he suddenly remembered that? It was nothing he wanted to remember. The man had stumbled backward, dropping his sword, pleading, yielding, even yanking off his thick black glove and thrusting it up before him as if it were a gauntlet. He was still shrieking for quarter as the white lifted him in the air by the throat and near ripped the head off him. The dead have no mercy left in them. And the others, no, I mustn't think of that. Don't think, don't remember. Just walk, just walk. Sobbing, he took another step. And by the way, there is some debate. Let's stop and have this right now. There is, oh, I guess I could take Quinn's uh, comment off the screen. I'll just leave it there forever. Once upon a time called right now. Um, the others were at the fist of the first men. Of course they were. Uh, I've heard some people say that they weren't, but they definitely were. Um, Sam literally says, oh, don't, don't think about the others. Don't remember. So he has something to remember. They must have at least seen them in the woods, you know, commanding the whites. And, and, and the whole point here is that this is one of the big clues that the others actually are pretty smart and have strategy. Um, we can see, looking back on the Waymar prologue, that they were playing games with the watch. Quit playing games with the watch. 
with the watch. It's true though. Um, they staged those bodies. They let they let Waymar see the bodies, and in the ten or fifteen minutes it took for Waymar to go and get the boys and come back and see him, all the bodies were gone. Um, they lured them into that clearing, and then they fought a duel with Waymar, and they probably allowed Garrod to escape. I don't think that they just missed him. So this was all strategic, and what they did at the fist was fairly strategic too. They attacked at a certain in the middle of the night. They sent the whites all around. And they whoop the Night's Watch ass. And so, uh, and now they're sort of chasing him away. This this idea that they're following the baggage train and they're sort of picking off the survivors, they probably could wipe them out if they wanted to. So it seems like they're almost letting a few people escape to bear the message back, potentially. But point is, um, you know, the, watch, the, the others were at the fist. Sam remembers them. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, maybe Sam was wrong. Maybe he just saw whites and thought there were others, but... Why wouldn't they be there, right? Like, of course, the whites go where the others command them. So, mm. all right. Sobbing, he took another step. A root beneath the crust caught his toe, and Sam tripped and fell heavily to one knee, so hard he bit his tongue. He could taste the blood in his mouth, warmer than anything he had tasted since the fist. This is the end, he thought. That's a little weird with stigmata, right? So the root caught his toe. So the he's being caught in the roots, just like a green seer, right? Um, but then he bites his tongue. And the weirwoods, of course, have bloody mouths. And when people are turning into weirwoods or going into the weirwoods symbolically, they are given the facial symbolism of the weirwoods, bloody eyes and mouth. So here he's getting caught in the roots, and he bites his tongue that gives him a bloody mouth. So... He is under some sort of, uh, like I said, the Night's Watch green zombies would have been resurrected with the help of the children of the forest. And we're, we're also told that the last hero, after being, you know, after all his friends died and he was chased by the others, he reemerges, leading the watch into battle against the others with a sword of dragon steel. So he goes, no friends and a broken sword to a new sword or reforged sword. And he's got new friends or resurrected friends. And the only thing we're told about the, the gap is that the children of the forest helped the last hero. So that's where I get the idea that if the Night's Watch was raised, it would have been by the, you know, the Green Seer magic. And that is, again, why the Night's Watch do this ritual where they go in front of the Weirwoods, they kneel as boys, green boys, and rise as men of the Watch, symbolically being reborn or resurrected. So let's actually pause for some art. Um, I've got two Night's Watch Oath pictures that I want to do. This first one is Didier Graffet. Wish it was a higher res photo, but it's super cool on the vibes here. And so again, they kneel before the weirwood tree as green boys, AKA living green men. Then they rise as black shadows, members of the Night's Watch. So it's very much like a resurrection ritual. We've seen all kinds of resurrection or at least sacrifice rituals before weirwoods. Bran sees a captive have his neck cut before the weirwood tree. <clears throat> Cold hands has some sort of neck or throat injury. And he is of course the model for a green zombie Night's Watchman, meaning that Cold Hands is, he's a resurrected skin changer, right? He commands an elk, which is not a tame animal, and he talks to the ravens and commands the ravens. So perhaps Blood Raven's doing all that, but my theory is that Cold Hands, like John, was a skin changer, that he was resurrected somehow, after perhaps after his body being cold whited, and that he retains his skin changer magic, even being undead. Just like John may well, uh, you know, retain his magic when he's resurrected. So this idea that, you know, the original template may have been the sacrifice in front of the Weirwood and the resurrection in front of the Weirwood. So just that's kind of what this looks like to me. And there's one other. Night's Watch Oath picture, but let me see if I can find it. That's oh, not coming up. Must be named something else. No worries.
Um, so let's break here real quick. And let me just take this, uh, this Fagon question from last week. Paul's asking me, uh, well, this was, okay. I think Fagon will be the good king that Varys describes to Kev Kevin. Uh, he'll close the gates of King's Landing and he'll be killed by the people or the plague. We're talking about the Grey Plague and King's Landing. So he'll do the right thing, this uh, Paul says, along with Illyrio and maybe Varys. And like Quentin Hightower and his son after the Grey Plague in Old Town, he may, you know, he may catch the blame. He's asking, can the Targaryens get grayscale? Absolutely. The Valerians were given grayscale by the Roynish through Garen's curse. Um, so yeah, Fagon will not, nobody will be immune to grayscale. Certainly not Targaryens. Um, yes, because like I said, that that's the origins of grayscale so far as we know is Garen's curse. And Christy Korn just says, thank you for doing the rereads. Oh, with a very generous PayPal. Thank you, Christy. Appreciate that very much. Mm, all right. Um, and then going down to my document here. Uh, from last week. Mr. Lassimol gave me a PayPal and asked me to give my bird a treat. I have since given the bird many treats. Uh, so we're in good shape there. Um, let's see, how do I... Ant Jest Tube. I'm sorry if that's not how it's said. It's, it's a strange handle. Uh, what would the good other imagery mean for a child of a Stark Dane marriage? Um, well, that's... Okay, so here here's... Great question. And, and this one actually is on topic for this week. So I just mentioned that I think it might have been Night's Queen that was a Stark. So here, check this out, right? What I feel the most strongly about is that the others are the offspring of the blood of the dragon flipped to ice. That is why they have the frozen star eyes. Nothing burns like the cold. They have all this fiery star imagery, but flipped to ice. They've also got ice dragon imagery, although it's longer and harder to explain so all of the figures that represent azor high almost all of them seem to turn into knight's king okay stannis is a great example it starts off the story claiming to be azor high waving around the flaming sword but we see all this blue black shadow symbolism attached to him then he comes up to the wall and what does he do he takes up residence at the night fort which is where the knight's king lived then he gives his seed and soul to Melisandre and they have shadow babies, just like Night's King gives his seed and soul to Night's Queen and they have white shadow babies, babies that are white shadows. Now we have shadow babies that are black shadows. So the whole thing is a parallel. Stannis is Azor High, but he turns into Night's King. John similarly has a lot of Night's King symbolism as well as Azor High symbolism. There are other characters who do it too. Um, but the point is, uh, Rhaegar is a great one. Aegon the Conqueror is a great one. Like Rhaegar has got all this dragon symbolism, but turns really dark. It's it's wears black armor, black horse, black lance. And then he marries an ice queen, Lyanna of the Blue Winter Rose. And they're doing a, a Knights King and Queen thing. So point is, I feel very sure that Azor High turned into the Knights King, the father of the others. Azor High fathered the others. That's probably the best way to say it. His dragon seed given to Knight's Queen, who, of course, is an ice priestess. That's how she's described. She She's almost like an other, but she's, she's a woman, uh, which is not something we've ever seen. So I think that she's probably more like Melisandre, where Melisandre is transforming into a fire entity slowly. It's possible that you could transform into an ice entity slowly and gradually. And so part of the creation of the others might have had to do with this Knight's Queen person who is, let's call her an ice priestess, okay? Now, if there's a human that's become an ice priestess, what house are they from? Stark, probably, right? And Lyanna Stark is the most important Knight's Queen parallel in the story. And a lot of the, a lot of the Knight's Queen figures become honorary Starks. Like Val is another Knight's Queen figure, and she almost marries John. Stannis wants to marry her to John and make her Lady Stark. Okay. <clears throat> Jane Poole is a Night's Queen figure. She's posing as Arya Stark. So you see how this works. Catelyn Tully 
is a Nissa Nissa figure until she gets undead and becomes a literal corpse queen. She is a Lady Stark who is a corpse queen, which is another name for Night's Queen. And so I think what you have here is that if Night's King is Azor High, that means Night's Queen, or Night's King rather, he's a blood of the dragon person. He's from the East. He's, he's the Bloodstone Emperor or related to him. So this, that's where the Danes come from. The Danes are from the Great Empire of the Dawn. That's why they have the Dragon Lord looks. They come from the Great Empire of the Dawn, just like the Valerians do. They have a common ancestor with Valeria. Check out my Great Empire of the Dawn Westeros video for more on that. And so if Night's King is Azor High, he's, he's the Dane figure. He's the blood of the dragon figure in this wedding. The Night's Queen is the Ice Priestess she is probably the Stark. And the last hero seems to be a child, again, of knights, king, and queen who is rescued or stolen and then raised as a Stark. So this last hero stolen other baby has the bloodline of both Stark and the Dane Great Empire of the Dawn bloodline. Although, again, it's been flipped to ice. Whatever fiery blood of the dragon mojo that Azor Ahai had was transformed through his sex magic with Night's Queen. It's a very cold Aleister Crowley thing happening. And the child is the blood of the dragon, but turned to ice, filtered through the icy womb of Night's Queen. And that is the last hero. He's a Stark and a Dane. He's blood of the dragon. He's blood of the other. Um, there you go. And the modern version is John, who is Targaryen and Stark. So Targaryen instead of Dane, but it's still half blood of the dragon, half blood of the other, half Stark. And he's got the skin changer magic as well. So you've got, you got all the magical bloodlines rolled together in the last hero figure and in John. And Great Empire of the Dawn Westeros is right there. Thank you, Minty Jane. Well, I'm riffing pretty good tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put another... Actually, I'm fine for a minute. I'll, I'll boil more tea in a minute. And there's one other missed super chat from last week. Pooter Wedge, Ironwood. A long question about Valerian Fire. Actually, it wasn't too long. Uh, Valerian Fire Whites. And it's the idea that the Valerians might have been turning their slaves into Fire Whites. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save that question for the next open Q&A, as you invited me to do in the PayPal, because, yeah, it's a little off topic. <clears throat> Good question, though, and I want to discuss it. So I'll come back to that one. But thank you. I wanted to at least say thank you. Oh, the Ned, the N plus A equals J people are always coming to yell at me. Um, symbolism wise, it would make sense if John were a Dane. I did entertain that theory for a minute. I looked real hard at it. Um, I was not predisposed against it, but have ruled it out because it isn't true. Because RLJ is true. <laughs> not to go off on a tangent, but um, the point of the Great Empire of the Dawn theory is to explain to you that the Danes. Are, are have a common ancestor with the Valerians and that the Dane blood is a blood of the dragon bloodline. Um, so Dane or Targaryen symbolically serves the same role. And it also explains um, why it's important that Egg married a Dane, Diana Dane, and then that Dane bloodline figures heavily into John and Danny's makeup because after Egg married a Dane, his kids had incest for two generations until we got Rhaegar and John and Danny. So John and Danny and Rhaegar have like a 25% to 50% Dane blood. They have a lot of Dane blood. Um, so yeah, it's all kind of mixed up. Um, you come at me if you want, but uh, there you go. I'm never mad at the N plus A equals J people because I understand why the theory is attractive. Um, John being a Dane, I do believe he's gonna wield Dawn um, so, and he is going to be the quote sword of the morning. He's just not, he's no more Dane. He's, his Dane blood comes from Diana Dane. And I don't, I don't, I think that's, that's basically it. <clears throat> and by the way, um, somebody had a really good comment about John's eye color and stuff. Okay. So if John is RLJ and Ned is taking this baby from the tower of joy they're lying about who is the, the idea is that Ned wants to hide the fact that he's Rhaegar's kid. Well, people have, have asked, 
what would have happened if John had come out with any silver hair, even a streak of silver hair or purple, visibly purple eyes? <clears throat> I think John's dark gray eyes might potentially look purple in lamplight or something kind of like dark star, but that's not noticed by anyone yet. So what would Ned have done if John had come out looking uh, Valerian like, like Rhaegar? Well, that's why they kept the Ashara Dane rumor alive because Ned could have then said that Ashara was the mother and that would have explained a little bit of Valerian looks in John. But once John was a little bit older to have show the hair color and stuff and the eye, you know, his eyes haven't turned or whatever. Then, then you know, there was no more talk of Ashara Dane, and Ned didn't need to push that reason anymore. But I think that was the reason why the rumor exists of Ashara and Ned is to cover the possibility of John revealing his Targaryen features. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, it does. All right, let me give you some art and put some tea on real quick. Let's go for the Sam art now. Definitely some good Sam art in the world. That'll do it. All right. And yes, I did get an electric tea kettle. Um, but of course, I waited to right before the stream to open it. And you're supposed to put water in it once and boil it and dump it out, sort of like clean it or whatever. And didn't have time to do that. So next stream, I'll have the electric tea kettle running. And then I won't have to leave and pause to make more tea, which is awesome. So this first one is from Katie Hall. It's obviously a, sort of a stylistic, cute Sam and Gilly with the baby. The White Walkers in the background there. Let me blow it up so you can see. Love this one. This creepy White Walker. Aliens in the background. Gilly's content. Sam is nervous and watchful. See, Sam is brave. By the time, see, by the time he rescues, <clears throat> by the time he rescues Gilly from Craster Keep, he's definitely found his courage. So then we've got. This is the scene where he's defending Gilly from this whited small Paul. And that, of course, is coming up in a couple of chapters later in the same book. Oh, and that is by, sorry, by uh, Caliodora. This is Sam and Gilly by Daniel Tarrant. It's pretty cool. I like that one. Here's a nice watercolor of them looking back at cold hands. I'll leave that one up while I go get the tea.
the tea is a brewing. It's a boiling, boiling, boiling. Ah, uh, yes. And it's going to be ready any second. But I did, I know you guys like to hear the whistle. So. Where, where are we? Drop the torch. Maslow's, oh man, I went back several pages, sorry. Oh, here it comes. Is it a bird? Is it a spirit? Is it a banshee? No, it's my tea. All right, here we are. Oh, it's the, it's the, it's the woods breathe behind me. Yes, your acid's kicking in now. Oh. All right. That's what it's like hanging out with me on acid. I do that kind of stuff. Like, how you feeling, man? Rrr. You're like, Dave, stop. I'm not even high. All right. So, catches a root catches beneath his toe. He trips and falls, bites his tongue, can taste the blood. Um, warmer than anything he had tasted since the fist. So his warm blood is being spilled out symbolically for the weirwood sacrifice. This is the end, he thought. Yes, yeah, so symbolic death. Now that he had fallen, he could not seem to find the strength to rise again. He groped for a tree branch and clutched it tight, trying to pull himself back to his feet. But his stiff legs would not support him. The male was too heavy, and he was too fat besides, and too weak and too tired. So he's clinging to the tree as he's sort of dying here tripped by the root is clinging to the tree asking for mercy praying to the old gods so praying to the weirwood i didn't even connect that right he's praying to the old gods so praying to the weirwoods in fact wasn't he praying to the weirwoods right before they tripped him yes he was mother have mercy he was he was praying to the weirwoods the old gods and then very shortly after he trips and falls very interesting so it's being chosen, symbolically chosen by the, by the woods. That's how to think about it. So back on your feet, Piggy. Um, oh, no, I skipped some. Sorry. Yeah, he grew up. No, the male was too heavy and he was too fat besides, too weak and too tired. Back on your feet, Piggy, someone growled as he went past. But Sam paid him no mind. I'll just lie down on the snow and close my eyes. It wouldn't be so bad dying here. He couldn't possibly be any colder. And after a little while... He wouldn't be able to feel the ache in his lower back or the terrible pain in his shoulders no more than he could feel his feet. I won't be the first to die. They can't say I was. Hundreds had died on the fist. They had died all around him, and more had died after. He'd seen them. Shivering, Sam released his grip on the tree and eased himself down into the snow. It was cold and wet, he knew, but he could scarcely feel it through all his clothing. He stared upward at the pale white sky as snowflakes drifted down on his stomach and his chest and his eyelids. The snow will cover me like a thick white blanket. It will be warm under the snow, and if they speak of me, they'll have to say I died a man of the night's watch. I did. I did. I did my duty. No one can say I forswore myself. I'm fat and I'm weak and I'm craven, but I did my duty. And this is a difference from the show, so that whole you only had one job meme. Let's set the record straight. Here we go. The Ravens had been his responsibility. That was why he had brought them. Uh, they had brought him along. He hadn't wanted to go. He'd told them. He'd told them all what a big coward he was. But Maester Eamon was very old and blind besides, so they had sent. They had to send Sam to tend the Ravens. The Lord Commander had given him his orders when they had made their camp on the fist. You're no fighter. We both know that, boy. If it happens that we're attacked, don't go trying to prove otherwise. You'll just get in the way. You're to send a message. And don't come running to ask what the letter should say. Write it out yourself and send one to Castle Black and another to the Shadow Tower. The old bear pointed a gloved finger right in Sam's face. I don't care if you're so scared that you foul your breeches. And I don't care if a thousand wildlings are coming over the walls howling for your blood. You get those birds off or I swear I'll, I'll hunt you through all seven hells and make you damn sorry that you didn't. 
and Mormont's own raven had bobbed its head up and down and croaked, Sorry! 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 Sam was sorry. Sorry he hadn't been braver or stronger or good with swords, that they had been a better that he hadn't been a better son to his father. His father is horrible. And a better brother to Dickon and the girls. He was sorry to die, too. But better men had died on the fist, good men and true, not squeaking fat boys like him. At least he would not have the old bear hunting him through hell, though. I got the birds off. I did that right, at least. He had written out the messages ahead of time, short messages and simple, telling of an attack on, <clears throat> on the first men, uh, on the fist of the first men, sorry. And then he had tucked them away safe in his parchment pouch, hoping he would never need to send them. <laughs> When the horns blew, Sam had been sleeping. He thought he was dreaming them at first, but when he opened his eyes, snow was falling on the camp, and the Black Brothers were all grabbing bows and spears and running toward the ring wall. Chet was the only one nearby, Maester Eamon's old steward, with a face full of boils and the big wen on his neck. Sam had never seen so much fear on a man's face as he saw in Chet's when that third blast came moaning through the trees. Help me get the birds off, he pleaded, but the other steward had turned and run off, dagger in hand. He has the dogs to care for, Sam remembered. Probably the Lord Commander had given him some orders as well. And of course, we know Chet was about to kill Sam, and the horn saved his life, uh, actually. But there is some serious mythical astronomy going on. So let's go back here. The horn that wakes the sleepers has made an appearance. So remember, I said the fist of the first men is a big moon symbol. Again, Venero points at the moon, makes a fist, and then explodes his hand. So just think about the moon as like a fist. When it explodes, fiery fingers of moon meteors fling off. Okay, you got the idea. Now, Fist of the First Men is ringed in fire, and it's their Black Knight's Watchmen carrying the fire. So think Black Moon, fire. It's a fire moon. Gets attacked. The others are basically symbolizing the comet here. And remember, the others have star eyes. So they can symbolize the comet that hits the moon. And they do in the Waymar Prologue and other places. So... That's what they're doing here. You got these stars that come. They hit the fist of the first men. The fist of the first men basically explodes. Okay. Now, we have raised the question, how did Azor High call the comet to hit the moon? How did he do it? It says that Nissa Nissa's scream broke the moon, but that doesn't make any sense. And we figured out that the dragon binder horn is compared to Nissa Nissa's scream in a bunch of cool ways. Check out the Danny Dragonbinder video. I don't want to go back over all that. But the horn screams like a woman, anguish and ecstasy, shivering hot scream. So it's just like Nissa Nissa's scream. The comet is also like a sword. Uh, the horn, sorry, is also like a dragon sword. It's banded in Valerian steel. It's long and sharp. It catches on fire just like Valerian steel. And a dragon's horn is literally a stabbing implement just like a sword. So the horn, Dragonbinder, has symbolism that ties it both to Nissa Nissa's scream, which broke the moon in the legend, and also the idea of a comet symbolizing a dragon or sword. The comet is actually the thing that broke the moon. So the question is, how did Azor Ahai call the comet? Well, the horn is a good idea because the horn um, sounds like Nissa Nissa's scream. So when we say that Nissa Nissa's scream broke the moon, well, what it was actually the horn that was blown that called the comet that broke the moon. And then when the comet stabbed the moon, it was also like a dragon horn stabbing the moon. So it works in a couple different layers. We've also got a dragon sword called Widow's Whale. So it's another clue that a woman's scream and a dragon sword are somehow the same thing. Well, it's the comet that broke the moon that ties to both of those com concepts. So here we have a horn that announces the arrival of the others who are this star, this burning star coming out of nowhere to bust up the moon circle, right? So here's this line was so good. It said, he had never seen so much fear on a man's face. He saw on Chet's when the third blast came moaning through the trees, the horn blast that announces the arrival of the others the arrival of the stars, the, burnt, the the comet, it sounded through the trees. It's moaning through the trees. Because remember, we've got all these clues about the horn calling the comet and breaking the moon. 
but we've also got a tons of clues about the trees wanting to break the moon. At the night fort, the weirwood is trying to pull the moon down into the well. In the in the Wayward Bride chapter that we read recently, the the trees were clawing at the face of the moon. There's a whole bunch of symbolism like that. So my conclusion <clears throat> was that weirwood magic and a magical horn are the two candidates for powerful magics that could reach up into space and steer a comet into a moon, okay? Now, there's even more symbolism about this because what called the others to the fist of the first men, it might have been the Horn of Winter. Because remember, John found the Horn of Winter and it says he couldn't get any sound out of it, which means he tried to blow it. Now, just as Dragonbinder's sound is ungodly loud, this horrible screaming that burns everyone's ears, well, the Horn of Winter is silent. So it seems like an intentional, excuse me, an intentional contrast between the silent horn and the screaming horn. The screaming horn calls the dragons. So some people have speculated that maybe the horn of winter called the others to the fist. I tend to think that this is true. And if so, it, it just fits the pattern. A magical horn calls the comet and then another horn uh, announces the arrival of the comet symbol, which again is the others. And the sound is moaning through the trees. So somehow it seems like maybe weirwood magic and a horn was used. I don't know how that works, but these, you know, these ideas are constantly tied to each other. Um, the hammer horn keep, for example, in the Iron Islands. <clears throat> the hammer horn keep is another one where somebody sees it clawing at the moon, the spiky iron battlements of the hammer horn keep clawing at the moon. It's in a damp hair chapter. Think about that name, Hammerhorn Keep. I've told you that the, the hammer of the waters is just a mythical account of a moon meteor impact. So you have, a, you have a claw, a dragon claw, obviously, clawing at the moon, but tied, it's, it's a hammerhorn claw that's clawing at the moon. So it's, the, it's a magic horn like Dragonbinder calling down the hammer of the waters by clawing at the moon. So the idea is given to us a lot of ways that horns are used in the calling of the comet. <clears throat> oh, it's still a little hot. <clears throat> also, Sam is a moon character himself. He has a moon face and he was woken up by the horn. So just, <laughs> it's, it's kind of redundant symbolism here. Um, then uh, Sam tries to get the birds off. And of course, the black ravens are symbols of meteors. So they come flying out of the first men, the fist of the first men, like moon meteors, right after the others arrive and the horn is sounded. Uh, same, same symbol as the black brothers with torches fleeing the fist. The black ravens also flee the fist. And of course, the Night's Watch are crows and the ravens are ravens. So again, same symbol. Black crows and ravens and fire flying away from the fist of the first men. Those are moon meteors flying away from the moon. So really tight mythical astronomy in this chapter. Um, I remembered that all this was here. I forgot that it was so tight. Uh, but yeah, really cool. So hang on one second. Hope you guys are enjoying this. And again, if you want to support the program, paypal.me slash mythical astronomy. Very easy to use. You don't need a PayPal account to do this. All you need is credit card number. You can send me money, thank me, or send me a comment or a question or a concern, uh, such as John Valentine has sent me. Uh, if you're going to read anything non-George R. R. Martin, maybe try Ancient Evenings, Norman Mailer. I will send you a copy if there's a way to arrange it. Uh, I've got no idea what that is, so I will, real quick, because I'll forget otherwise, I will put this, I'll open a tab. And search this historical novel set in ancient Egypt. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I understand why I might find that interesting. Thanks for the tip. I'll check that out later. Very thoughtful. I always love it when people give me uh, thoughtful little tips like that. It means I feel like they know me like a friend and want to recommend something. So, all right. Thanks for the compliments, guys. I see the. I see you guys like my analysis here. Uh, I see I see the see the applause and the, the cheerful comments. Thank you. It won't slow the stream down by reading them all, but thanks, guys. 
Thanks. Definitely a fun chapter that I've picked here. So let's keep reading. Now that we've laid out all this symbolism and, um, and a cool, like I said, this is really funny how one character's world is so different than another character's world, right? He wakes up and sees Chet and he's like, huh, I wonder what he was doing. He just ran off with a knife. I guess he must have had something to do. Completely oblivious to the fact that, yeah, I know ravens aren't crows. Oh, my God. It's OK. They're, they're, they're like cousins or something. It's OK. Jeez whiz. <laughs> Not to overreact, but it's, it's cool, man. It's symbolically, they're the same. The same in terms of symbolism. Even if they're only cousins in real life, it's all right. Anyways, if you want the crows of the Night's Watch and the Raven is the Green Seer, right? But they're all the, the Green Seer is used to be on the Night's Watch. So it's all, yeah, they're they're cousins, like I said. All right. Um, so uh okay. Um so when the horns blew, Sam had been sleeping. So he wakes up, and like I said, he's completely unaware of Chet was about to kill him and we just spent the whole uh prologue with the with chet going over the plot so we've seen chet's world where his his entire mutiny was foiled essentially and then he was still going to kill sam and even that was foiled so <laughs> too many bird arguments on this channel <laughs> minty says where's that i gotta highlight that that's great <clears throat> and they're only the same in terms of symbolism tony only in terms of symbol yes yeah, so scary as fuck yes they are so yes they are very different they act differently they're both in the corvid family however they have some the thing is they're both scavengers and they're both very intelligent and those are the symbols that are being worked with in the story so yeah, i've said my piece on this um so his fingers had been so stiff and clumsy in the gloves, and he was shaking from fear and cold. But he found the parchment part, uh, the parchment pouch, and dug out the messages he'd written. The ravens were shrieking furiously, and when he opened the castle black cage, one of them flew right in his face. Two more escaped before Sam could catch one, and when it when he did, it pecked him through his glove, drawing blood. Yet somehow he had held on long enough to attach the little roll of parchment. The war horn had fallen silent by then, but the fist rang with the shouted commands and the clatter of steel. Fly, Sam called as he tossed the raven into the air. The birds in the shadow tower cage were screaming and fluttering about so madly that he was afraid to open the door, but he made himself do it anyway. This time he caught the first raven that tried to escape. A moment later, it was clawing its way up through the falling snow, bearing word of the attack. And by the way, I will say that ravens are huge. Crows are big, but ravens are even bigger. Um, so this is no joke when it's like Sam's trying to catch a raven trying to fly out of the cage. That is very hard. And they're big. They could definitely put out an eye or give you a nice little wound. Um, you know, uh, so this is definitely an intimidating thing that he's having to do to manage these ravens. Like it's not it's not an easy it's sort of glossed over like, oh, they just sent a raven with a message. But like, no, you have to like interact with a wild animal. <laughs> Even a trained animal is still, you know, still wild, especially with all this chaos. They're they're now actually, essentially acting like wild animals, you know, flapping around and screaming and stuff. So, um, the birds in the shadow. Okay, so, um, it was clawing its way through the falling snow, bearing word of the attack. So his duty done, he finished dressing with clumsy, frightened fingers, donning his cap and surcoat and hooded cloak, and buckling on his sword belt. Buckling, buckling it real tight so it wouldn't fall down. <laughs> then he found his pack and stuffed all his things inside, spare small clothes and dry socks, the dragon glass arrowheads and spearhead John had given him, and the old horn too, his parchments, inks, and quills, the maps he'd been drawing, and a rock-hard garlic sausage he'd been saving since the wall. He tied it all up and shouldered the pack onto his back. The Lord Commander said I wasn't to rush to the ring wall, he recalled, but he said I shouldn't come running to him either. Sam took a deep breath and realized he did not know what to do next. <clears throat> uh, 
He remembered turning in a circle, lost. The fear growing in so by turning in a circle. So he's spinning like a moon on its axis or like a spinning meteor, perhaps. Uh, the fear growing inside him as it always did. There were dogs barking and the horses trumpeting, but the snow muffled the sounds and made them seem far away. Sam could see nothing beyond three yards, not even the torches burning along the low stone wall that ringed the crown of the hill. So crown of fire, another Azor high symbol. Could the torches have gone out? That was too scary to think about. The horn blew thrice long. Three long blasts means the others. The white walkers of the wood, the cold shadows, the monsters of the tales that made him squeak and tremble as a boy, riding their giant ice spiders, hungry for blood. There must be an old man down at uh, Horn Hill as well, huh? <laughs> Minty says, can't wait till he gets to eat that garlic sausage. All right. Awkwardly, he drew his sword and plodded heavily through the snow, holding it. A dog ran past barking, and he saw some of the men from the Shadow Tower, big bearded men with long axes and eight-foot spears. He felt safer for their company, so he followed them to the wall. When he saw the torches still burning atop the ring of stones, a shudder of relief went through him. The Black Brothers stood with swords and spears in hand, watching the snowfall, waiting. Sir Malador Locke went, on by, went by on his horse, wearing a snow-speckled helm. Sam stood well back behind the others, looking for Gren or Dolores Ed. If I have to die, let me die beside my friends, he remembered thinking. But all the men around him were strangers, Shadow Tower men under the command of the ranger named Blaine. Here they come, he heard a brother say. Notch, said Blaine. And Twenty black arrows were pulled from his many quivers and notched to his many bowstrings. Gods be good, there's hundreds, a voice said softly. Draw, said Blaine, and then hold. Sam could not see and did not want to see. The men of the Night's Watch stood behind their torches, waiting with arrows pulled back to their ears as something came up that dark, slippery slope through the snow. Hold, Blaine said again. Hold, hold, and then loose. <clears throat> and the arrows whispered as they flew. A ragged cheer went up from the men along the ring wall, but it died quickly. They're not stopping, my lord, a man said to Blaine, and then another shouted, more, look, they're coming from the trees. And yet another said, gods have mercy, they're crawling. They're almost here, they're on us. Sam had been backing away by then, shaking like the last leaf on the tree when the wind kicks up, as much from cold as from fear. It had been very cold that night, even colder than now. The snow feels almost warm. I feel better now. A little rest was all I needed. Maybe in a little while, I'll be strong enough to walk again. In a little while. Because remember, he's having this whole flashback while he's laying in the snow in front of the tree. So that's interesting. He was at the fist of the first men. He was shaking like the last leaf on the tree. But then in his, in the current moment, he was just holding on to the tree that tripped him. And now he's falling down in front of the tree and he's about to die in front of the tree. So there's tons of, Sam becoming the tree symbolism. He bit his tongue. That's what's when he tripped, gave him the weirwood stigmata, shaking like a leaf. So again, I say that when the Night's Watchmen die, that become the last hero's green zombie soldiers, this whole death and resurrection has to do with the weirwoods. They might be sacrificed to the weirwoods or just killed by the white walkers of the woods who come out of the trees, as we saw in this passage. A horse stepped past his head, a shaggy gray beast with snow in its mane and hooves crusted with ice. Sam watched it come and watched it go. Another appeared from out of the falling snow with a man in black leading it. When he saw Sam in his path, he cursed him and led the horse around. I wish I had a horse, he thought. If I had a horse, I could keep going. I could sit and even sleep some in the saddle. Most of their mounts had been lost at the fist, though, and those that remained carried their food, their torches, and their wounded. Sam wasn't wounded, only fat and weak, and the greatest craven in the Seven Kingdoms. He was such a coward. Lord Randall, his father, had always said so, and he'd been right. Sam was his heir, but he had never been worthy, so his father had sent him away to the wall. His little brother Dickon would inherit the Tarley lands and castle and the great sword Heartsbane that the lords of Horn Hill had borne so proudly for centuries. He wondered whether Dickon would shed a tear for his brother who died in the snow 
somewhere off beyond the edge of the world. Why should he? Coward's not worth weeping over. He had heard his father tell his mother as much, half a hundred times. The old bear knew it too. Fire arrows, the Lord Commander roared that night on the fist, when he appeared suddenly astride his horse. Give them flame. It was then he noticed Sam there quaking. Tarly, get out of here. Your place is with the ravens. I, I got the messages away. Good. On Mormon's shoulder, his own, his own raven echoed. Good, good. The Lord Commander looked huge in fur and mail. Behind his black iron visor, his eyes were fierce. You're in the way here. Go back to the cages. If I need to send another message, I don't want to have to find you first. See that the birds are ready. He did not wait for a response, but turned his horse and trotted around the ring, shouting, fire, give them fire. So here we have the moon, you know, just shooting off fire arrows, black ravens flying, black crows, again, shooting fire arrows and then carrying the torches out. So lots of black thing, bla flying black objects, flying fiery objects emerging from this ring of fire, the fist of the first men, which once again represents the moon. Sam did not need to be told twice. He went back to the birds as fast as his fat legs could carry him. I should write the messages ahead of time, he thought, so we can get the birds away as fast as need be. Good idea, actually. It's really smart. It took him longer than it should to have to light his little fire to warm the frozen ink. He sat beside it on a rock with quill and parchment and wrote his messages. Attacked amidst snow and cold, but we've thrown them back with fire arrows, he wrote. As he heard Thorin Smallwood's voice ring out with a command of notch, draw, loose. The flight of arrows made a sound as sweet as a mother's prayer. Burn, you dead bastards, burn, Dywin sang out, cackling. The brothers cheered and cursed. All safe, he wrote. We remain on the fist of the first men. Sam hoped they were better archers than him. He put that note aside and found another blank parchment. Still fighting on the fist amidst heavy snow, he wrote when someone shouted. He wrote uh, when someone shouted, They've, they're still coming. Results uncertain. Spears, someone said. It might have been Sir Malador, but Sam could not swear to it. Whites attacked us on the fist in snow, he wrote, but we drove them off with fire. He turned his head. Through the drifting snow, all he could see was the huge fire at the center of the camp, with mounted men moving restlessly around it. So this is <laughs> the reserve he knew, ready to ride down and uh, ride down anything that breached the ring wall. They had armed themselves with torches in place of swords and were lighting, the, lighting them in the flames. So torches in place of swords conflates the idea of a torch and a sword. So just like Mithras, who carries a torch and a sword, we're supposed to be thinking of Lightbringer here, which is, of course, a flaming sword, a sword that is also a torch. The Red Comet is compared to swords and torches. It's called Mormont's Torch. Okay. <clears throat> so... This reserve, there's a central fire in the, on, at the Fist of the First Men, which again represents the fire moon. So this is literally the fiery core of the moon here that we're talking about. Imagine the moon Io of Jupiter, which is, has a, is completely molten inside and covered with black silicate rock. That is the fire moon. That is the Fist of the First Men. So, and then the, the, the black Night's Watch soldiers with, with torch swords. Okay, torches in place of swords. They're riding around the central fire, simulating the orbiting of the moon. So it's literally turning on its axis, just like Sam was turning a second ago, Sam being a moon character. So this is really great mythical astronomy. This is George is really going to like dorky lengths here by having the molten moon core and showing us that it's spinning with these torch swords that are ready to ride out anywhere that the the cold star breaches the exterior so i mean it's this is about as good as dreamfire trying to fly out of the dragon pit and cracking open the dome of the dragon pit just like an egg hatching from its shell the moon was an egg khaleesi so this is right up there <laughs> yeah, right. Tony Sled. Another uh, one of Sam's notes could have said, um, we are done. Don't come, Sam Tarley. Yeah, party's over. Nah, it's really not worth coming through. Like, it's like the text. Should we go? Is it still happening? Nah, it's, 
pretty much pretty much dead. <laughs> Very much dead at the fist of the first men. <clears throat> All right. So the reserve, he knew, ready to ride down anything that breached the ring wall. They had armed themselves with torches in place of swords and were lighting them in the flames. So <laughs> this, the, they're lighting their, the torch sword meteors that are soon to be flung out from the moon. They're lighting them with the central fire of the moon's core. So really good stuff. And it says, whites all around us, he wrote, when he heard the shouts from the north face. Coming up from north and south at once. Spears and swords don't stop them, only fire. Loose, 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 a voice screamed in the night. And another shouted, bloody huge. And a third voice said, a giant. And a fourth insisted, a bear, a bear. <laughs> all covered with hair. All big and brown, uncovered with hair. So literally, the bear and the maiden fair being sung here <laughs> at the Fist of the First Men. George having a sneaky joke. <laughs> Oh man, that's uh that's pretty great, right? <laughs> a bear, a bear. They say it twice, just so we know it's a thing. A horse shrieked, and the hounds began to bay, and there was so much shouting that Sam couldn't make out the voices anymore. He rode faster, note after note. Dead wildlings and a giant, or maybe a bear, on us all around. He heard the crash of steel on wood, which could only mean one thing. Whites over the ring wall, fighting inside the camp. A dozen mounted brothers pounded past him toward the east wall, burning brands, streaming flames in each rider's hand. So now they're really going to look like comets and meteors, <laughs> streaming flames as they ride. And of course, the Black Brothers are wearing black, their black shadows, so they're basically invisible. It's just the torch that is visible, so it really does look like a shooting star there. And as Sam's writing again, Lord Commander Mormont is meeting them with fire. We've won. We're winning. We're holding our own. We're cutting our way free and retreating for the wall. We're trapped on the fist, hard pressed. One of the Shadow Tower men came staggering out of the darkness to fall at Sam's feet. He crawled within a foot of the fire before he died. Lost, Sam wrote. The battle's lost. We're all lost. Why must he remember the fight at the fist? He didn't want to remember. Not that. He tried to make himself remember his mother or his little sister Tala or that girl Gilly at Craster's Keep. Someone was shaking him by the shoulder. Get up, a voice said. Sam, you can't go to sleep here. Get up and keep walking. I wasn't asleep. I was remembering. Go away, he said, his words frosting in the cold air. I'm well. I want to rest. Get up. Gren's voice, harsh and husky. He loomed over Sam, his blacks crusty with snow. There's no resting. The old bear said, you'll die. Gren, he smiled. No, truly, I'm good here. You just go on. I'll catch you after I've rested a bit longer. You won't. Gren's thick brown beard was frozen all around his mouth. So Gren Snowbeard here, like Edric Snowbeard. It made him look like some old man. Yeah, like Edric Snowbeard, who lived to be a very old man. You'll freeze or the others will get you. Sam, get up. And that just tells you freezing is a symbol for ice transformation, for being got, taken by the others. And Sam is indeed, he's been freezing, you know, he's wearing the ice armor, et cetera, et cetera. The night before they left the wall, Pip had teased Gren the way he did. Sam remembered, smiling and saying how Gren was a good choice for the ranging since he was too stupid to be terrified. Gren hotly denied it until he realized what he was saying. He was stocky and thick-necked and strong. Sir Alistair Thorne had called him Orox, the same way he called Sam Sir Piggy and John Lord Snow. But he'd always, treat, but he'd always treated Sam nice. But he had always treated, thank you, Tongue, he had always treated Sam nice enough. That was only because of John, though. If it weren't for John, none of them would have liked me. And now John was gone, lost in the skirling pass with Cor in half hand, and most likely dead. Sam would have cried for him, but those tears would only freeze as well, and he could scarcely keep his eyes open now. A tall brother with a torch stopped beside them, and for a wonderful moment, Sam felt the warmth of his the warmth on his face. 
Leave him, the man said to Gren. If he can't walk, if they can't walk, they're done. Save your strength for yourself, Gren. He'll get up, Gren replied. He only needs a hand. The man moved on, taking the blessed warmth with him. Gren tried to pull Sam to his feet. That hurts, he complained. Stop it. Gren, you're hurting my arm. Stop. And I am going to stop for a second. I need to, uh, <clears throat> hang on. I need to freshen my voice up one second. Let me give you some more art. There was more Sam art that I didn't show you, including this excellent one by Magali Villanueva. Oh, yes. This is like Sam on the way out to the ranging. He's still, still brave. I don't know. He does have, actually, he does have tears in his eyes. Let me see. They're tearing up from the cold. Yeah, they kind of are. There you go. You're right. One second. Half a second. Oh, yeah. <coughs> hmm. Pay no attention to the coughing behind the curtain. Hmm. Yes. It is a Friday night fright, so got to make sure I'm frightfully stoned. And I definitely am now. Yes. Mm. Ah, yes. Hmm. Me, 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 Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> mm. Ah, ah, hmm. All right. So where were we? Where were we? The torchbearer urges Gren not to help Sam. Gren is going to help Sam because Gren's, Gren's good guy. Uh, let's see. So he says, you're too bloody heavy. Graham, uh, Gren jammed his hands into Sam's armpits. Sometimes when I'm nervous, I take my hands and I put them in my armpits and I take them out and smell them. Forget, however that Saturday Night Live skit went, showing my age. It's a very old Saturday Night Live skit. You guys probably don't know it. And yes, that was Rhaegar's voice. He comes out when I'm stoned. And when I've been drinking, you know whose voice comes out. <laughs> Miss Mr. Bobby Brathian. But he's not here tonight because I've been drinking. So... um. Sort of a stoned. I'm wearing the Rhaegar glasses. Uh, so, yes, uh, I guess it snuck out. I guess it snuck out. Uh, so, let's see here. So, Gren jams his hands into Sam's armpits, gave a grunt, and hauled him upright. But the moment he let go, the fat boy sat back down in the snow. Gren kicked him, a solid thump that cracked the crust of snow around his boot and sent it flying everywhere. Get up. He kicked him again. Get up and walk. You have to walk. Okay, Jesus. Who do you think you are, Gren? <laughs> Talking to La Sam is Lazarus. Sam fell over sideways, curling up into a tight ball like a moon to protect himself from the kicks. He hardly felt them through all this wool and leather and mail, but even so, they hurt. I thought Gren was my friend. You shouldn't kick your friends. Why won't they let me be? I just need to rest, that's all. To rest and sleep some and maybe die a little. If you take the torch, I can take the fat boy. Suddenly, he was jerked up into the cold air, away from his sweet, soft snow. He was floating. There was an arm under his knee and another one under his back. Sam raised his head and blinked. A face loomed close, broad, brutal face with a flat nose and small, dark eyes and a thicket of coarse brown beard. He had seen the face before, but it took him a moment to remember. Paul. Small Paul. Melting ice ran down into his eyes from the heat of the torch. Can you carry him? He heard Gren ask. 
I carried a calf once that was heavier than him. I carried him down to his mother so we could get a drink of milk. All right, so we got to stop for the symbolism. This is just killing me. I hope you guys are catching this. Um, uh, yes, muscled like an Eddard's fantasy. That was me mm, at my prime. Anyways, uh, so first of all, Gren is the one telling him to get up. Gren, Gren, his name is Gren, G-R-E-N-N. -N. Change it to green. So instead of a Gren man, he's a green man. So Sam dying in front of a tree, caught in the roots with the weirwood stigmata, now a green man is telling him to get up and walk. So again, I say that the Night's Watch was resurrected by green seers, by green men, children of the forest, something along those lines. Yes, thank you, Iron Trone, <laughs> giving me the uh, Sesame Street uh, phonetic uh, layout there. I appreciate that. So green man tells Sam to get up. So this is definitely a Night's Watch resurrection show that's going on here. He's frozen to death because remember, the last hero's friends, they died while they were being pursued by the others. So they died somewhere in the north. They died cold deaths. His his sword uh, snapped from the cold. So the cold deaths, but resurrected with fire seems to be the, the way that it goes. Then it says, Sam rose into the air, right? Uh, where was that line? Suddenly he was jerked up into the cold air away from his sweet, soft snow. He was floating. So Sam is now floating. This is very much like a spirit rising out of his corpse, like floating up into the air, right? Um, and it's it's also sounds, you know, like a floating moon. And of course, uh, Small Paul says, I carried a calf once. And, you know, moons and cows have a very strong symbolic connotation because Moons are white, they're milk white, and we're talking about carry the calf so we could get a drink of milk. Um, there's there's more to that. Of course, the cows also have horns, duh, that's the other thing. Cows' horns look like a, a lunar crescent. So calling Sam a cow is just as good as calling him a moon figure, and now he's floating and being carried. Um, so he's it's astronomy going on as well as he's a resurrected Night's Watch brother. He's also some sort of moon meteor because, of, remember, he's just been flung from the oh so yeah moon yeah moo moo moon, moon yeah they're even saying moon yeah moon milk exactly moons are like titties we had once there were two moons in the sky yes and by the way in case you're wondering there are scenes in which woman's breasts are used to symbolize the two moons it does happen i know i've pointed it out before but uh we'll save that for a different stream we've We've kicked around the idea of doing a naughty symbolism stream for like April Fools or something. Who knows? Maybe it'll happen one day. I'm glad you guys are entertained. Yes, the cow jumped over the moon. Yes, it's it's a folkloric association. It's as old as time. It's not obscure at all. Uh, so. So Sam is floating. Uh, and I think the most important symbol here is that he's floating like a spirit rising from his body. So the green man has told him to rise now his 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 spirit is rising, and someone who's really a giant but is called small is carrying him. So I, I don't know what that's about. No, I still haven't seen the Green Knight. I've been working on my videos. I should go see it while it's still in theaters. I maybe not. Maybe I should just wait till it comes home. That's actually safer. All right. Um, let's see here. So yes. There are many reread podcasts, folks, but there are none that read you the entire chapter like me. And there are certainly none that say the shit that I say here. So I hope you're enjoying the program. And uh, yeah, this is a unique YouTube channel that you found here. If you just found me recently, I'll just say that. So the night before, oh, okay, I read that already. Um, okay, so Small Paul says he, he's carried a calf before. So we can carry Sam, which, yes, someone mentioned in the comments. That's fucking crazy. Small Paul is seriously strong. No doubt. Sam is heavy. Sam's head bobbed up and down with every step that Small Paul took. Stop it, he muttered. Put me down. 
I'm not a baby. I'm a man of the night's watch, he sobs. Just let me die. <laughs> so he says, I'm not a baby. That's, of course, more language to making make us think of Sam being reborn here. He's being reborn. He says, just let me die. But he already did a symbolic death, and now he's a baby. And he's literally being carried like a baby. So it's pretty great stuff. Be quiet, Sam, said Gren, the green man. Save your strength. Think about your sist sisters and brothers. Maester Eamon, your favorite foods. Sing a song if you like. Aloud? In your head. Sam knew a hundred songs, but when he tried to think of one, he couldn't. The words had all gone from his head. He sobbed again and said, I don't know any songs, Gren. I did know some, but now I don't. Yes, you do, said Gren. How about the bear and the maiden fair? Everybody knows that one. A bear there was. A bear. A bear. All black and brown and covered with hair. So funny. And then, no, not that one, Sam pleaded. The bear that had come up the fist had no hair left on its rotted flesh. He didn't want to think about bears. No songs. Please, Gren. <laughs> So George is making sure that we, um, uh, making sure that we notice the line where he called out to the bear in the maiden fair earlier when someone was like a bear, a bear. So he's just he just wants to make sure we got his joke and and we did we got it George thank you. Think about your ravens then, they were never mine, they were the Lord Commander's ravens, the ravens of the Night's Watch. They belong to Castle Black and the Shadow Tower. Small Paul frowned. Chet said I could have the old bear's raven, the one that talks. I saved food for it and everything. He shook his head. I forgot, though. I left the food where I hid it. He plodded onward, pale white breath coming from his mouth with every step, then suddenly said, Could I have one of your ravens? Just the one. I'd never let Lark eat it. So this is more plotting coming out here. Small Paul was roped into the treason plotters um, because he's not very clever. He was taken advantage of and deceived and tricked or something. But he was in on the plot, and they, they promised him that he could have a raven if he participated. Um, probably didn't tell him the whole plan. But he was supposed to get a raven. So it's interesting. Sam started this chapter almost being killed by Chet, one of the plotters. Then he was just saved by another one of the plotters, Small Paul. So it's kind of funny how George bookended that, and now we're hearing more details about the plot coming out. So it definitely came full circle real quick. They're gone, said Sam. I'm sorry. So sorry. They're flying back to the wall now. He had set the birds free when he'd heard the war horn sound once more, calling the watch to horse. Two short blasts and a long one. That was the call to mount up. But there was no reason to mount unless to abandon the fist, and that meant the battle was lost. The fear bit him so strong that it was all Sam could do to open the cage. Open the cages. Only as he watched the last raven flap up into the snowstorm did he realize that he had forgotten to send any of the messages that he'd written. No, he squealed. No, no, no. The snow fell and the horns blew. They cried. To horse, to horse, to horse. Sam saw two ravens perched on a rock and ran after them, but the birds flapped off lazily through the swirling snow in opposite directions. He chased one, his breath puffing out his nose in thick white clouds, stumbled, and found himself ten feet away from the ring wall. So, Sam did screw up a little bit, but the thing is, he really didn't, because when, when all these ravens are received with no messages they figure out something really bad has happened. It's like, okay, the lack of message is the message. This says that all the Night's Watch Ravens got set loose at once, which means they got, you know, they got messed up. So uh, it pretty much does work. Uh, and he more or less did his job. Um, but once again, the horn sounds as the Ravens fly off. And that's giving us that whole symbolism again where the moon uh the 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 dragon binder horn is somehow cracking the moon or calling the comet to crack the moon which then flings off the meteor so we got the horn and the ravens flying off at the same time and it says after that he remembered the dead coming over the stones with arrows in their faces and through their throats some were in ring mail and some were almost naked wildlings most of them but a few wore faded blacks he remembered one of the Shadow Tower men shoving his spear through a white's pale soft belly and out his back and how the thing 
staggered right up the shaft and reached down his black hands and twisted the brother's head around till blood came out his mouth. That was when his bladder let go the first time. He was almost sure. He did not remember running, but he must have, because the next he knew, he was near the fire half a camp away with old Sir Auden Withers and some archers. Sir Auden was on his knees in the snow, staring at the chaos around them until a riderless horse came by and kicked him in the face. The archers paid him no mind. They were loosing fire arrows at shadows in the dark. Sam saw one white hit, saw the flames engulf it, but there were a dozen more behind it and a huge pale shape that must have been the bear. And soon enough, the bowmen had no arrows. Oops, we got a mute. We well, got a mute. Let me go back. Um, that was a short one, though, right? I didn't miss much. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Sam found himself on a horse. It wasn't his own horse, and he never recalled mounting up either. Maybe it was the horse that had smashed Sir Otten's face in. The horns were still blowing, so he kicked the horse and turned him toward the sound. In the midst of the carnage and chaos and blowing snow. So he's Sam is playing the role of a moon meteor and he's charging towards the sound. So the the horn is literally calling him, Sam the moon meteor, out of out of the moon. In the midst of the carnage and chaos and blowing snow, he found Dolorous Ed sitting on his garin with a plain black banner on a spear. Sam, Ed said when he saw him, would you wake me, please? I am having this terrible nightmare. More men were very, very dollarous head thing to say there. Oh, and by the way, I wanted to go back and say that I totally don't you feel bad for Sam? Like he thought he was smart enough to think of writing the messages ahead of time, but then he forgot to attach them. It's like, it's just something I do being a guy with ADHD. Like I'm creative and I think of clever things to do. Uh, and then forget some crucial thing at the end to screw it up. As I, I so sympathize with Sam. He's like, oh no. I was like, oh God. Oh, mm. I really felt that one. So uh, let's see. Okay. So see so yeah, how Dollar said, says, Sam, would you wake me, please? I'm having this terrible nightmare. So this also is to imply that the, the Night's Watch are fighting a war in the weirwood net that there's, you know, this, this is a dream sequence, something like that. Uh, more men were mounting up every moment. The war horns called them back. They're over the West wall. My Lord, Thorn Smallwood screamed at the old bear as he fought to control his horse. I'll send reserves. No, Mormont had to bellow at the top of his lungs to be heard over the horns. Call them back. We have to cut our way out. He stood in his stirrups, his black cloak snapping in the wind, the fire shining off his armor. Spearhead, he roared. Form wedge. We ride. Down the south face, then east. My lord, the south slope's crawling with them. The others are too steep, Mormont said. We have. His garin screamed and reared and almost threw him as the bear came staggering through the snow. Sam pissed himself all over again. I didn't think I had any more left inside me. The bear was dead pale and rotting, its fur and skin all sloughed off, and its half its arm, half its right arm burned to the bone, yet still it came on. Only its eyes lived, bright blue, just as John said. They shone like frozen stars. Thorn Smallwood charged, his longsword shining all orange and red from the light of the fire. His swing near took the bear's head off, and then the bear took his. So a couple of times, the Night's Watchmen have just been implied as fiery warriors, right? The old the fire is shining off the old bear's armor, uh, making him look like he has fire armor. And then Thorn's long sword shimmers with the red in the light of the fire. So you can you can imagine the real uh the real original struggle again with the last hero and the war for the dawn. The Night's Watch would have all been armed with flaming swords or maybe flaming dragon glass knives, fiery magical weapons. I think we will see a whole like Jon Snow with a dozen fighters, the last watch, if you will, 
and they'll all have Valerian steel or flaming dragon glass or something. There's definitely 12 weapons floating around, so. Ride, the Lord Commander shouted, wheeling. They were at a gallop by the time they reached the ring. Sam had always been too frightened to jump a horse before, but when the low stone wall loomed up before him, he knew he had no choice. Actually, before we go any further, let me, let me just one more astronomy thing. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> keep calling it a ring ring of fire i keep telling you it's a moon ring of fire moon ring of fire ring moon ring fire uh they're telling you that it, about the eclipse because remember the moon wandered too close to the sun and cracked from the heat that specifies an eclipse alignment that's the only way a moon can wander too close to the sun and as you see an eclipse produces a ring of fire so there my friends is a top view of the fist of the first men and its ring of fire. Burn, 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 that ring of fire. Yeah, that's definitely, Um, I didn't realize that, but George is definitely trying to make us sing Johnny Cash here. Uh, as many times as he said ring of fire and somebody was yelling at the whites, burn, burn. I wanted to make a Beavis and Butthead joke, but that was the Johnny Cash joke. Totally right. Thank you. Um, yes, Iron Trone and everyone else who said that. That ring of fire. There you go. Very cool. All right. But yes, that that is the eclipse ring. That is the point of the ring of fire on mythical astronomy terms. The sun wanders too close to the moon. That's when it cracks. That's when the dragons are born. That's when the comet hits the moon. Oh, nice. Smelt My Ruin has Johnny Cash shirt on as we speak. And yes, that is Dark Souls art. This one is by uh, it's called Soul of Cinder by Muhammad Saad. I, you know, when I found the Dark Souls artwork and realized that it was so Azor high like, I realized I was like, I just gotta use it. I usually try not to use video game art, but it's too good. It's too, it's too Azor high. And then once I saw they had the eclipse and the flaming sword, I was like, dude, ah, I gotta use that for my video. So the new Nightbringer video will definitely have. Uh, that good Dark Souls artwork. In fact, I found a new Dark Souls artwork. Let me show you this one. I've never played the game, so I don't know what I'm looking at. I do know that the guy who did the lore for this game did another project that George consulted on. So there may be some George ideas filtering into Dark Souls. There is a line of transmission there. Um, take a look at this. Of course, George is working with classic fantasy tropes. He didn't invent flaming swords or anything like that, so... This one is called uh, just Dark Souls by uh, Stephen Kakei. But this is Azor High, the first Stark or something, <laughs> right? So it's a fiery dude with a big black sword, but he's also got a flaming wolf next to him. So this is like, yeah. Um, so Elden Ring. Yeah, so Elden Ring is, is the project that George wrote on, uh, worked with. Uh, who is, what's the guy's name? Miyazaki. Uh, so yeah, there's, I just don't, I don't play games guys. I'm only vaguely aware of this stuff. I'm sorry. I just don't, uh, have any time. I spent all my time making videos, uh, using video game art, but yeah, Elden Ring is the connection. So yeah, very cool. Dark soul stuff. Back to the chapter at hand. <clears throat> so they were at a gallop by the time they reached the ring sam had always been too frightened to jump a horse before but when the low stone wall loomed up before him he knew he had no choice he kicked and closed his eyes and whimpered and the garen took him over somehow somehow the garen took him over the rider to his right came crashing down in a tangle of steel and leather and screaming horse flesh and then the whites were swarming over him and the wedge was closing up they plunged down the hillside at a run, through clutching black hands and burning blue eyes and blowing snow. Horses stumbled and rolled. Men were swept from their saddles. Torches spun through the air like meteors. Axes and swords hacked at dead flesh, and Samuel Tarley sobbed, clutching desperately to his horse with a strength he never knew he had. He was in the middle of the flying spearhead. Okay, the flying spearhead. Jesus Christ. So we know that spears are a very important moon meteor symbol. 
The sun spear of Dorne is a symbol of the hammer of the waters as, as a moon meteor. And then, of course, Benera, when he makes his fist and makes it explode in fire, he's standing next to a thousand soldiers of the Lord of Light who all have fiery spears, but they're called the fiery fingers. They're the fiery hand of R'hllor. And they're the fingers, and there's a thousand of them, and they have spears. There was a thousand, thousand dragons that came from the moon when it cracked open. So you guys understand, the moon meteors are like sun spears. Because again, the moon dragons drank the fire of the sun. The moon wandered too close to the sun, cracked from the heat. The dragons came out, and they breathed the fire of the sun. That's just a way of saying that the meteors are like the children of the sun and the moon. They're pieces of moon that have the sun's fire. What was I talking about? Um, the spear. Ah, oh, yes, the spear. So the sun spear is an important moon meteor symbol, just like a sword or a torch, a spear. So we've got this flying spear. All the fiery, fire-bearing night's watchmen are flying out of the broken moon in the form of a fiery spear. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. All right, I got it. I got it. Martin says, truly, Dave Lightbringer, you should give Skyrim a try. It's like liquid Game of Thrones directly into your brain. Now, I don't even like have a, a, a system to play games on. I guess I guess my computer counts, right? Um, yeah. Uh, oh, people of the sun reference. Yeah, very nice. Yes. <clears throat> Since 1516, mine's attacked and overseen. Something like that. Man, it's been a long time. All right. Um, all right. Where are we? Uh, fire arrows. Then they became an arrow. So they're loosing fire arrows, and then they become a, fi a fiery spear. Uh, it went back like two pages. Um, let's see. He was in the middle of the flying spearhead with brothers on either side and before and behind him as well. A dog ran with them for a ways, bounding down the snowy slope and in and out among the horses, but it could not keep up. The whites stood their ground and were ridden down and trampled under hoof. Even as they fell, they clutched at swords and stirrups in the legs of passing horses. Sam saw one claw open at Garin's belly with its right hand while it clung to the saddle with its left. That might even be the same horse that Sam... Uh, sees later that the other is riding because it has the uh, <clears throat> uh, or at least one of the one of the one of the um, I forget if it's the white or the other, but I think it's the white that's riding the horse where the entrails are hanging out the horse's belly. So it might be the same horse. Suddenly, the trees were all about them, and Sam was splashing through a frozen stream with the sounds of slaughter dwindling behind him. Okay, that's major symbolism. We've seen that other transformation is strongly tied to the frozen lake symbolism, okay? The others speak like ice on a winter lake cracking. When John and Varamir die, it's like plunging through an icy lake. We see um, uh, at that lake, the frozen lake where Stannis is, um, the weirwood are on islands, which are like the, uh, the frozen fists of some drowned giant punching up through the icy lake. Then we see Harwood fell fall into the lake and get ice transformation symbolism. So the icy lake is serving as symbol of the place where the others come from and go to the barrier between life and death. But on the other side is the frozen land that the others come from. Or if you want to speak green sea, the green seers live in the green sea. Well, the others are from the weirwoods too. So they have this frozen pond. That's kind of like the green sea symbolism. So you'll notice that it says, suddenly the trees were all about them and Sam was splashing through a frozen stream. So they're in the trees because again, Sam is dying at the fist of the first men. So he's going into the trees and he's splashing through a frozen stream. That's just more ice transformation symbolism going through the frozen stream. So the sounds of slaughter dwindling behind. He turned breathless with relief until a man in black leapt from the brush and yanked him out of the saddle. Whoever he was, Sam never saw. He was up in an instant and galloping away the next. So another night's watchman, a cowardly one, stole Sam's horse. When he tried to run after the horse, his feet tangled in a root, and he fell hard on his face, and lay weeping like a baby until Dolores had found him there. 
So that's another repeat of the entire symbolism earlier in the chapter. Sam was fleeing. His feet got tangled in a root. He fell on his face, got blood in his mouth, and then was picked up like a baby, symbolizing his death and rebirth. Here again, he's breathless, so he's dying. He's, he's in the trees going through the icy stream. So that's, that's ice transformation. Now he's falling and he's weeping like a baby again until someone finds him in another Night's Watchman and picks him up. So it's the entire death and rebirth symbolism through the weirwoods, but also through the ice magic. And it's, it's, it's mimicked twice. So it's pretty cool stuff there. Then it says, that was his last coherent memory of the fist of the first men. Later, hours later, he stood shivering among the other survivors, half mounted and half afoot. They were miles from the fist by then, though Sam did not remember how. Dywin had led down five, uh, led down five pack horses, heavy laden with food and oil and torches, and three had made it this far. That was miraculous. Dywin led five pack horses from the fist. That was a friggin' miracle. The old bear made them redistribute the loads, or redistribute the loads, so the loss of any one horse and its provisions would not be such a catastrophe. By the way, earlier I read a word sloughing that I hear people mispronounce, uh, mispronounce, <laughs> mispronounce. <laughs> I don't want people to mispronounce words, okay? It's very important to me. <laughs> mispronounce. Sloughing, S-L-O-U-G-H. Looks like slough or slew or something. That's slough. So when the skin sloughs off a burning corpse, that's how you spell that, slough. Uh, yeah, that's so... So don't, uh, yeah, don't mispronounce that one. <laughs> All right, am I being cute? Is this cute? All right, where are we? Flying spearhead. Three uh, Garen's supplies redistributed. Um, All right. So he took the Garen's from the healthy men and gave them to the wounded, organized the walkers, uh-oh, and set torches to guard their flanks and rear. So some of the Night's Watchmen have become white walkers. Some of them have torches. Some of them are freezing, right? So he's organizing the walkers. That's cool. Very cool. All I need to do is walk, Sam told himself. So Sam is a walker. And he took the first step toward home. But before an hour was gone, he began to struggle and to lag. They were lagging now as well, he saw. He remembered Pip saying once how small Paul was the strongest man in the watch. He must be to carry me. Yet even so, the snow was growing deeper, the ground more treacherous, and Paul's strides had begun to shorten. More horsemen passed. Wounded men who looked at Sam with dull, incurious eyes. Some torchbearers went by as well. You're falling behind, one told them. The next one agreed. No one's like to wait for you, Paul. Leave the pig for the dead men. He promised I could have a bird, Small Paul said, even though Sam hadn't. Not truly. They aren't mine to give. I want me a bird that talks and eats corn from my hand. So he's Small Paul, like Gren, that saved Sam, is being implied as a green man or a green seer. That's, that's who keeps the ravens, you know, skin changers and green seers. Oh, let's see, where were we? Bloody fool, the torch man said. Then he was gone. It was a while after when Gren stopped suddenly. We're alone, he said in a hoarse voice. I can't see the other torches. Was that the rear guard? Small Paul had no answer for him. The big man gave a grunt and sank to his knees. Um, his arms trembled as he lay Sam gently in the snow. I can't carry you no more. I would, but I can't. He shivered violently. The wind sighed through the trees, driving a fine spray of snow into their faces. The cold was so bitter that Sam felt naked. He looked for the other torches, but they were gone, every one of them. There was only the one Gren carried, 
the flames rising from it like pale orange silks. He could see through them to the black beyond. So Sam, that's a symbolic fire vision that Sam is having here. That torch will burn out soon, he thought, when we are all alone without food or friends or fire. So that's cool. He sees through the fire to the black beyond. So this is definitely like a fire vision, a dragon glass candle kind of a thing, seeing into the void. Um, I'm not sure what that means in the context of the, the action of this chapter. But, oh, okay. Well, here we go. Let's just keep reading. <clears throat> that torch will burn out soon, he thought, and we'll, we're all alone without food or friends or fire. But that was wrong. They weren't alone at all. The lower branches of the great green sentinel shed their burden of snow with a soft, wet plop. Gren's, Gren spun, thrusting out his torch. Who goes there? A horse's head emerged from the darkness. Sam felt a moment's relief until he saw the horse. Hoarfrost covered it like a sheen of frozen sweat, and a nest of stiff black entrails dragged from its open belly. On its back was a rider, pale as ice. Sam made a whimpery sound deep in his throat. He was so scared he might have pissed himself all over again, but the cold was in him, a cold so savage that his bladder felt frozen solid. The other slid gracefully from the saddle to stand upon the snow. Sword slim it was, and milky white. Its armor rippled and shifted as it moved, and its feet did not break the crust of the new-fallen snow. Small Paul unslung the long... Oh, it's uh, 420. Gosh. Here it is. So let me pull out... Perfect artwork to set the mood. Uh, oh, it's right here. This exact chapter. This exact scene, in fact. I'm glad I remembered that this existed, which I would not have remembered without the 420 reminder. I know I can remember if I just get high. <clears throat> I know I can remember if I just get high. Oh, man, the tally voice is hard to do. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's embarrassing. I can usually do a really good tally. Ah, Martin says, sorry, late to the stream. Have you perhaps talked about Sam Tarley being Heimdall, the hornblower? Well, we've talked a lot about magic horns, that's for sure. And I, I have a whole stream dedicated to Hamdahl symbolism. Um, and Sam Tarley's not blowing the horns yet, but he is waking with the horn. So yeah, check out the, uh, the beginning of the stream. Lots of horn talk. But I didn't I didn't work in the Hamdahl yet because Sam doesn't. Um, I guess he is carrying the horn, but he's not uh, he's not blowing it yet. But but Martin, uh, just to make sure you you did see my um, Hamdahl's horn of winter stream. I hope because I I did talk about all that stuff. So. One second. It is 420 Central Time in the United States and somewhere else in Europe. Buzz in if you know the answer. So Heimdallr can see anything happening anywhere because as I discussed in that stream, Heimdallr seems to represent Yggdrasil itself. Uh, Jackson Crawford, uh, who has a great Norse mythology channel, he is an expert at Norse mythology, agrees with this interpretation, even though it's not ironclad, it is subjective, but Heimdallr is the guardian and the watchman because he is Yggdrasil. So he is, uh, what's cool about that is that, um, is that uh, uh, Heimdallr is both the horn blower and the tree. And remember, I was saying that the two magical powers that Martin is implying as hurting the moon are the horn, the dragon binder horn, or just magical horns in general, and the weirwood trees, which appear to claw at the moon. 
So I believe he's talking about Heimdallr and Yggdrasil, where the horn is is tied to Yggdrasil. And even before people figured out that Heimdallr was the tree, it was said that Heimdallr's Gajalar horn, or Jalar horn, I think it's just how it's said, is uh, hidden underneath of one of Yggdrasil's roots. So the horn is tied to the wall in many ways, yes. All right, so... Um, Uh, cool. Yeah. So if you want the Heimdallr symbolism, go back again for the Heimdallr's Horn of Winter live stream in the Odin Norse mythology series. So I'll leave this picture up as I read, since this is literally the scene that we're reading. And let me back up with the read the other description again so we can get the get the feel going into the action here. So rider pale as ice. He was so scared. Uh, so, OK, the other slid gracefully from the saddle to stand upon the snow. Sword slim it was, and milky white. Its armor rippled and shifted as it moved, and its feet did not break the crust of the new fallen snow. Small Paul unslung... Oh, gosh, I, for I forgot. I wanted to go back for one thing. I'm sorry, guys. Um, sim before I'm going to forget if I don't go back. Uh, where was it? Shit, I totally... Mm, there was a really good symbolism catch, and I read over it. And where was it? Oh, shoot. I might just have to leave it. Can't remember what it was. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. So glad I remember this. Okay, this is worth it. Sorry for the broken stream of thought here, but... So when it says the torch will die all soon, it says that was wrong. They weren't alone at all. And then we're introduced to the other. Listen to the sentence that comes. The lower branches of the great green sentinel shed their burden of snow with a soft, wet plop. Gren spun, spun around and says, who goes there? And then the horse's head and the other emerge. So just as we're told over and over, the white walkers come from the wood. The white walkers of the wood, they emerge from the trees. We see a sentinel tree. A sentinel is a watcher. So a tree that is a watcher. And again, the White Walkers are called watchers twice in the first uh, chapter of the story. And the Weirwoods are also called watchers. So the sentinel tree is a tree that's a watcher. It's a green sentinel, but it's got a burden of snow. It's covered in snow. That is just telling you about the green men, guys, Weirwalkers video. Green men turned it into white walkers. The white walkers are the spirits of dead green men forced out of the weirwood trees. So here we have a green tree that's a watcher shedding its snow as if it's creating another. And then who walks out? The other. So it's, it's like really important direct symbolism here. A green tree that's been frozen gives birth to another. That's what just happened. It's this, it's, it's the same thing as the frozen weirwood in the Vermeer Sixkins prologue, where we see this the 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 frozen hands crawling up the weirwood. The weirwood is armored in ice. It's a pale shadow armored in ice. So the weirwood's described as an other, and then the others appear right after that, just to make us do the comparison. So there you go. Yep, you guys are enjoying the symbolism tonight. I'm glad I'm I'm on fire here. Uh, frozen fire, of course. That's what we need against the other. So going back to the scene now, we now that I've given you the symbolism, the other slid gracefully from the saddle to stand upon the snow. Its feet didn't break the snow. Armor rippled and shivered as it moved. So small Paul unslung the long hafted ax strapped across his back. Why'd you hurt that horse? That was Monty's horse. So small Paul recognizes the horse too. Sam groped for the hilt of the sword, but the scabbard was empty. He had lost it on the fist, he remembered too late. Get away! Gren took a step, thrusting the torch out before him. Away, or you burn! He poked at it with the flames. The other's sword gleamed with a faint blue glow. It moved toward Gren, lightning quick, slashing. When the ice blue blade brushed the flames, a screech stabbed Sam's ears sharp as a needle. 
The head of the torch tumbled sideways to vanish beneath a deep drift of snow. The fire snuffed out at once. And all Gren held was a short wooden stick. He flung it at the other, cursing, as small Paul charged in with his axe. So a little bit of symbolism there. This is just a repeat of the sword of the of the uh, Fist of the First Men symbolism in miniature. So Fist of the First Men is a ring of torches. The others come attack it. The others are like the comet. All right. Um, so they are coming in like a star sword to break the moon. Then we have the other with its blue sword chopping off the torch just as the others attack the fist of first men full of torches. Then the head of the torch falls off like a moon meteor falling off the moon and falls into the snow. So again, I will say that one of the meteors may have fallen in the heart of winter. And I missed a super chat. Yeah, I totally remember that. So let me go back here. Um, yeah, so the rainbow Bifrost bridge is definitely the wall, Martin. And again, you got to go back and watch the Hamdollar's Horn of Winter stream. We definitely went into all that. But yes, you're totally right. The wall is absolutely the a Song of Ice and Fire version of the Bifrost Bridge. And that's how you say it, by the way. Bifrost, not Bifrost. Bifrost. And um, Bifrost. That should be, I guess, a little Icelandic accent. Um, yeah, so Heim Heimdall guards the Bifrost, just like the Night's Watch guards the wall, and just like the Weirwoods guard the wall. So yeah, all those ideas are woven together pretty tightly pretty tightly all right mm. so the other sword gleamed uh oh never mind sorry um also there was nissa nissa's scream too <clears throat> if the others like the comet and gren's torch is like the moon there's a scream that happens when the when the 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 comet the other the frozen comet sword remember comets are made of ice so an ice sword works very well as a comet symbol when the ice sword hits the flames of the torch which represents the moon there is that horrible screaming sound that sh stabs sam's ears like a needle and of course needle well we have a sword named needle and needles are just tiny swords anyway so here we have a scream that's like a sword remember i told you Widow's Whale is a sword that's like a scream. The Dragon Binder is a dragon horn that parallels a dragon sword and sounds like Nissa Nissa's scream because Nissa Nissa's scream is associated with cracking the moon, but actually it was a comet that cracked the moon, which is like a sword or a dragon with a, with a horn poking the moon. So here again, we've got Nissa Nissa's scream happening when the comet strikes the moon. So it's just letting you know. It's just recreating the, the whole scene here, essentially. Uh, so then we have uh, only a short wooden stick is left. So it sounds kind of like a tree. Um, think of celestial axis here. Uh, so the, the fear that filled Sam then was worse than any fear he had ever felt before. And Samuel Tarly knew every kind of fear. That's such a great line. Mother, have mercy. He wept forgetting the old gods in his terror. Father, protect me. Oh, his fingers found his dagger, and he filled his hand with that. The whites had been slow, clumsy things, but the other was light as snow on the wind. It slid away from Paul's axe, armor rippling, and its crystal sword twisted and spun and slipped between the iron rings of Paul's mail through leather and wool and bone and flesh. It came out his back with a hiss, and Sam heard Paul say, Oh, as he lost the axe, impaled, his blood smoking around the sword, the big man tried to reach his killer with his hands and almost had before he fell. So small Paul tries to pull the same trick that the other pulled, um, or that the, uh, yeah, that one of the whites pulled on one of the Night's Watchmen at the fist. We just saw it. <clears throat> but it does say, that the weight of small Paul tore the strange pale sword from the other's grip. So now he's unarmed. Do it now. Stop crying and fight, you baby. Fight, Craven. It was his father he heard. It was Alistair Thorne. It was his brother Dickon and the boy Rast. Craven, Craven, Craven. He giggled hysterically, wondering if they would make a white of him, a huge, fat white, always tripping over its own dead feet. Do it, Sam. Was that John now? John was dead. 
You can do it. You can. Just do it. And then he was stumbling forward, falling more than running, really, closing his eyes and shoving the dagger blindly out before him with both hands. He heard a crack, like the sound ice makes when it breaks beneath a man's foot. And then a screech so shrill and sharp that he went staggering backward with his hands over his muffled ears and fell hard on his arse. <clears throat> when he opened his eyes, the other's armor was running down its legs in rivulets as pale blue blood hissed and steamed around the black dragonglass dagger in its throat. And you can imagine the wicked, wist, wicked witch of the West melting, I'm melting. <laughs> <clears throat> it reached down with two bone white hands to pull out the knife, but where the fingers touched the obsidian, they smoked. So bone white hands, that's weirwood language. The weirwood branches are described as being bone white and like hands. And so we see the other revealing its true nature. And it says, Sam rolled onto his side, eyes wide, as the other shrank and puddled. And that's why this other has been nicknamed Sir Puddles. Also, the, the blue blood, some people think that's a clue about the others being royalty, meaning Azor High's offspring. But of course, what color could Ice Demon's blood be? It'd have to be blue anyway. So... That could just be a confluence, um, but, you know. The Night's Watch are spelled out as like bastards and rejects. And so it makes sense that the others are kind of like the lords, kind of like royalty. They ride horses. They're very distinguished. So I do think the blue blood symbolism is a thing there. All right, so... Fingers smoking as it touches the obsidian. This is also just super cool here, right? To think of it's trying to pull the obsidian out of itself, but it just melts when it touches it. So it can't, it's just trying, but it can't say, okay. So Sam it's, it shrank and puddled dissolving away in 20 heartbeats. It's flesh was gone, swirling away in a fine white mist beneath were bones like milk glass, pale and shiny. And they were melting too. I'm just going to leave that alone for now. Finally, only the dragon glass dagger remained, wreathed in steam as if it were alive and sweating. Gren bent to scoop it up and flung it down at once. Mother, that's cold. Obsidian. Sam struggled to his knees. Dragon glass, they call it. Dragon glass. Dragon glass. He giggled and cried and doubled over to heave his courage out onto the snow. Gren pulled Sam to his feet checked small Paul for a pulse and closed his eyes, then snatched up the dagger again. This time he was able to hold it. You keep it, Sam said. You're not craven like me. So craven you killed another? Gren pointed with a knife. Look there, through the trees. Pink light. Dawn, Sam. Dawn. That must be east. If we head that way, we should catch Mormont. If you say... Sam kicked his left foot against a tree to knock off all the snow. Then the right. I'll try. Grimacing, he took a step. I'll try hard. And then another. So that's the chapter. Very good. Um, very cool. And going back for a little bit of last symbolism. So obviously the other has bones pale like milk glass. Right? Like, wow. How did that happen? Um, and yeah... We're all still here. It's the dawn. Yeah, the sun's about to come up, too. It's coming up on the East Coast, if anybody's with me on the East Coast. But um, it's uh, 2.30 here on the West Coast. In any case, yes. Yeah. So the other's bone, it's shin bone. I always imagine it being a shin bone. Looks like the sword dawn. It's milk glass, pale and shiny. And the others also have pale swords. And dawn is made from a pale stone, and it is a pale sword. Um, uh, the the tower at Starfall is called the Pale Sword Tower. So the links between Dawn and the others are very abundant. Now, here's the thing. They all come from the great empire of the Dawn. If the others are the children of Azor High, as I say, then they, Azor High comes from the great empire of the Dawn. The Sword Dawn definitely comes from the great empire of the Dawn, that's for sure. So I think that's the link here. Um, 
we're we're being shown that the others are are like the sword dawn they both come from the great empire of the dawn and even though dawn's name is dawn and it comes from the great empire of the dawn it is also the original ice because the last hero who again was a stark this is the good other figure they almost certainly would have used dawn against the others dawn would be the dragon steel sword of the last hero so a Stark last hero carrying a white sword. And then we're told that the Starks have been naming their swords ice since the age of heroes. Well, it's pretty obvious where that tradition started. Dawn literally looks like a big stick of ice. It looks like the bone of a, a white walker, which is literally made of ice. So Dawn is the original ice because it was the sword of the last hero used on loan from the Danes and the Great Empire of the Dawn, probably. The Starks didn't keep it. The last hero just used it. And then, for some reason, the Danes took it back and kept it in the South, probably because it's their fucking sword. Like, they brought... it. The Danes come from the Great Empire of the Dawn. Dawn comes from the Great Empire of the Dawn. There's all the Numenor correlations. So the Danes either made Dawn in Westeros with technology and magic they learned from the Great Empire of the Dawn, or they brought the sword from the Great Empire of the Dawn. So either way, it's Great Empire of the Dawn tech. Belong to the Danes. They give it to the last hero because they're involved in all these events. And the last hero uses it. It begins the naming tradition of ice with the Starks, but it's then given back to the Danes when it's nicknamed then the Sword of the Morning because it's the sword that helped bring the dawn. And what happens in this scene right after they kill the other, they see dawn. The fingers of dawn, rosy fingers of dawn through the trees. So the trees have helped the Night's Watch bring the dawn, win the war for the dawn, just like we know the children of the forest helped the last hero. So this entire chapter is about the last hero being a frozen figure who escapes from the others. He's icy transformed, but he's brought back to life under the care of the Weirwoods, who've tripped him twice fortuitously during this flight. And that's the story. So think of Cold Hands. He's an icy white, but he doesn't belong to the others. He fights for the living, and he has concert with the Night's Watch and the Green Seers and Blood Raven and the Children of the Forest. So that kind of implies that at some point, somebody can be ice whited, but then rescued and saved. So that's that's what's going to happen to John, as I predicted. Lord Snow video and promise to the others video. His body is going to be whited by the others, but then repossessed when he'll be become a hero. And that's what's happened to Sam in this whole chapter. He put on the ice armor of the others. He dressed up like an other. He became frozen. He had the cold inside him. But then he was saved with the dragon glass. He was saved by the Gren man, the green man saved by the trees that tripped him up. And then finally, he kills the other and wins the War for the Dawn in miniature. So it's a great chapter full of symbolism. It's got great action. All the symbolism complements the action as Sam's heart in conflict comes, boils up right at the end. Remember, the, the chapter started with this refrain of sobbing, Sam took another step. So he thinks he's so cowardly, but he's one of the few survivors from the fist and he's still marching three days. He hasn't slept and he's still marching. That is like, so, I mean, he's, he's, he's not a craven. He's a survivor. I'm a survivor. And then at the very end of the chapter, he's like, oh, he gives his knife pathetically to Gren. He's like, you take it. And you're not a coward like me. And he's like, so craven, you killed another. So here begins the legend of Sam, the slayer. And Sam literally has the, like, dude, not only did you survive the fist of the first men, you just killed another. So that's like pretty amazing, right? Um, so this is Sam has reached the the nadir of his cowardice, but he's also now um, I don't know if nadir is the right word, but the the low point of his cowardice, and now he's back on his way to becoming Sam the Slayer, full of courage and trouble for the White Walkers. So. There you go, guys. This was a great chapter, fun stream, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. Yes, I, I, you, I see that you've put together that my head is the third eye, 
of the three eyes here. I'm the eyes of the winter goddess. Eyes of night's queen. Yes, that's me. David Lightbringer. See, Lightbringer means Venus, as you guys know. And David means beloved. So David Lightbringer means beloved of Venus, which is a really nice name, and I like it. And I am I like to think that I am beloved of the goddess and that I serve the great goddess. So here I am as her third eye. There you go. So guys, if you have any questions or or uh, topics to discuss about any of this symbolic claptrap that I've thrown out or about Sam and the others, I will wait around a few minutes to field any questions that you might have. Yes, Menti is Venus. Absolutely. I'm your Venus. I'm your fire. Yeah, she's my Venus anyways. <clears throat> You know, of course, my whole theory on gods and goddesses, as you know, is one of archetypes, to turn this into a serious comment. Um, and so the idea of the great mother goddess, the great fertility goddess, that essentially is like the essence of our conception of woman. That's that's more or less what it is. So you could say that everyone has a piece of the god or the goddess inside them. And really, we have both because every because we, uh, you know, the masculine and feminine qualities everyone has. So you've got uh, all kinds of archetypes swimming around inside you, you could say. But yes, everybody should look at their their partner and see see the face of God in them in, in miniature because God is love and love is what brings people together. So I, I actually believe that. I, I do. So if Benjamin ran into the others, what did you think uh, happened? Having stark blood and all. Well, having stark blood doesn't save you from the others. But it does, it might mean that the others have special interest in you. Because remember, they thought Waymar might be John, might be the promised one that they're looking for. So I think they would have had special interest in Benjen. They might have transformed him into some monster or just a regular White Walker or a white, or he could just be dead. Uh, I definitely think he's dead. Um, the Raven told us that he's dead. When, when John and Mormont talk about Benjen, the crow pipes up. It's like, dead, dead, or the raven, rather. Dead, dead, dead. So he's definitely dead. Does Sam the Slayer have any more symbolic meaning beyond face value? Um, Well, I mean, in that he represents like the moon meteor flinging away. You know, he's, you know, he's, those are destructive. But no, it's just, just a good nickname. Oh, Lazar just showed up. Yeah, we're only two and a half hours into the stream, Lazar. <laughs> but uh, it's, it was a great stream, so definitely have fun uh, watching back. This was maybe one of the best chapter, maybe the best chapter reread I've done so far. This was definitely uh, tons of fun. Packed with content. Long chapter, lots of uh, lots of symbolism. Why are all the Stark children wargs like that? What are the odds? Does Catelyn even have good blood? Um, I've heard the theories that Catelyn has went blood and that is going back to the Riverlands and maybe, maybe. But I, I think that more more likely is that the, the presence of the direwolves activated it. And the direwolves all got there because Blood Raven piloted that pregnant mama wolf south of the wall. It's really the only explanation for how it got there. Um, so this was done on purpose to help awaken the gifts of the Starks because otherwise there's no explanation for it. The Stark bloodline, like if you look at the Kings of Winter going back centuries, they all have wolves at their side. That implies the first Starks were wargs. If they defeated the warg king with all those green seers, they must've been wargs as well. The last hero was surely a skin changer and a warg. So <clears throat> basically it's just strong in the Stark bloodline. And I believe it was activated by the presence of the dire wolves, just like the dragons, dragon eggs being put in the cradles of Targaryens. That is what I suspect. Yeah. Warg comes from the word, uh, Varger, which, uh, which means wolf, but also can mean like werewolf. And, uh, yeah. The Berserkir and Ulf Hednar symbolism is strong 
with the Starks. Uh, definitely check out the Odin Origins, Bran and John and Blood Raven videos. So, do you think this, the others are connected to the shade of the evening trees? Well, the shade of the evening trees symbolize the others half of the weirwood net. They symbolize the weirwood net that's been traumatized by Azel or High and frozen. <clears throat> and that's why we see the undying. The others are undying also. The undying uh, at the house of the undying are cold blue shadows. And they're gathered around a cold blue heart, just as the others are cold shadows that are from the heart of winter. So the entire house of the undying is a mock-up of the heart of winter. And they have those inverted trees a shade of the evening trees and of course the others are associated with a long night <laughs> so kind of all fits together now what i don't know is are the shade of the evening trees actually transformed weirwood trees or are they just a weird tree that george was using for symbolism i don't know but in the heart of winter we should find a frozen weirwood tree and it might look like a shade of the evening tree or it might even be a shade of the evening tree check out um live stream that i just did ask lml about your theories for because we talked about this in more detail and i will show you also this cool frozen weirwood artwork that somebody did named Bo zonavade and it's awesome because this is exactly what i think is in the heart of winter or the black stone perhaps but definitely a frozen weirwood 100 percent gotta be Maybe a whole frozen weirwood grove. So maybe it will be black with blue leaves. But do the others drink weirwood paste? No, I don't think they need to. They probably did when they were green seers, right? <laughs> Fernando Cook says, I'm drunk an egg. <laughs> Good for you, buddy. <clears throat> Cool. Well, it looks like you guys enjoyed the stream. Not a ton of questions. It was just cool. <laughs> yeah, it is great artwork. I'm definitely going to use that. So we should find oily stone, frozen weirwood. Those are the two things I want to see in the heart of winter. And yeah, there's that Ask Me About Your Theories 4 video. Creepy stuff up in the north. Yes, indeed. Yeah, perhaps the others drink shade of the evening. I don't think they need to anymore. Um, it's just symbolic. It's, it's, it's to show you that like the others can gradually transform or they transformed through weirwood magic because the green seers take the weirwood paste to bond with the trees. So here we have these symbolic others drinking shade of the evening to get that way. So it's just kind of a nice parallel. Cool guys. Well, we are two hours and 45 minutes in. Wow. I didn't think I was going to do that long of a stream, but it's been fun. Thanks for joining me. And uh, I am planning on doing one this Sunday. Um, I could, I might call it off if I need the time to finish the Nightbringer stuff, but Nightbringer videos are coming out next week, Monday through Friday. And if I can do a Sunday stream, I will at the normal time of 3 o'clock Pacific, 10 p.m. GMT. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for the PayPals. Thanks for the Super Chats. Thanks for your excellent presence. And, uh, yeah, thanks for listening to me talk about symbolism. I guess that's really what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it always does tickle my heart that people want to hear what I have to say about the song of ice and fire and symbolism and moon meteors and all that. So I'm going to sleep tonight with a sense of well-being. Well, th this morning, going to sleep this morning with a sense of well-being. So thanks guys. And I'll see you very soon with either a Sunday stream or Nightbringer part one, part, part one out of five on Monday. <laughs>